Hi there, I'm Josh. I finally got around to putting out another Pantheon exploration explanation video. This time with the Norse Pantheon. I have been getting many suggestions in my other videos for other Pantheons to do. One of my comments, you know who you are, suggested me to look into the Norse Pantheon. And I'm very aware that Norse paganism, heathenism, is probably one of the most popular neo-pagan movements and um, pantheons these days. Here comes taters. There's dictators. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so one of the major reasons that actually finally convinced me, yeah, I want to do this, was I realized that in my comparison between different mythologies, I found many aspects of Norse that aren't covered very much. Oh, and I have some hypotheses and some suggestions that I feel like I'm actually contributing to the field. And maybe an expert in Norse could look more deeply into this to test my hypotheses to see if they have any validity. Maybe experts are only focused on Norse. They might not realize the connections it has with Finnish or with Mediterranean Middle Eastern, um, and I feel like there's a lot of new stuff I have to give. I'm not a specialist, and I'm not classically trained in mythology or comparative religion in particular. My background is in geography. In general, I'm very interdisciplinary, and I generally tend to use the integral method. I like to show how things are all related. You know, I'm essentially a polymath. And so when I look at pantheons like the Norse, I'm able to look at these deities not only as records, like a historian or anthropologist or archaeologist might do. I look at them also as aspects of a perspective, of a philosophical perspective. Like, there are people who are practicing worship of Norse deities to this day, rewriting and updating, revaluating these deities through a modern lens or whatever lens they're coming from. And so I can't escape the fact I am coming to it with a certain agenda. My agenda is to integrate the deities from many different pantheons. If you don't like comparative mythology, if you want to be a complete specialist only in Norse and you want to hear a, a, an expert on Norse talk about Norse to you, I am probably not the person. There are plenty of people out there that do it. As you can see, I have evolved my formula yet again. I'm still doing the astrological, zodiacal correlation. And I know that's quite controversial, and especially for people in the sciences, they're going to think that's very controversial and just, just click off the video when they see that there's astrology related to it. Not only is that quite closed-minded, but what I'm doing with them is coding for certain archetypes. So it's just a system I've found that's quite universal and useful, and I've added nuance to it through having cusp signs. Um, that you can see there's more than 12 uh, over here. There are 12 cusps in between every main sign from Aries to Pisces. So what I'm going to do when I find a correlation with somebody is I'll take this, I'm working in Photoshop right now, duplicate it and I'll drag, drag it onto someday the lower right corner and essentially it will be a way of saying that I've, I've done that one, it's done. And this time I've been developing a few different family tree style charts. As someone who does graphic design, I design cards. I figured I would use my skills in graphic design to actually create some charts and also to generate um, the imagery that you see here. First one I did was Hittites and I actually generated 3D imagery in the style of my statue deck. Here I did a black and white art style. I thought the black and white style actually was a really good way of showing a subtle difference between every single deity. And so I was able to get, as you can see, a pretty good amount of deities onto this chart. It's paper size. And I have these on our Etsy as downloadables. There's three different versions. One comes like this with each, the colors are all based on different kind of family groupings, like the Aesir, Vanir, and such. And there's another version that has them all colored based on archetype. And then there's a, another one that's black and white and it's optimized for a black and white printer so that you could just print it out. I have a version right here. I printed out for myself. As I do this series, I'm going to be creating a chart for every single one that I do. 
and I'm gonna have a little basically staple these all together and make a little booklet for myself. I think that's enough of an intro. Let's uh, let's get started. Okay, so first off, we have Mundulfari, and his name means the one moving according to particular times. So he's very much sort of a grandfather time figure. In particular, he is involved with astrology and calendars and um, the seasons. He's actually very similar to the Orphic Greek god Kronos. You know, Chrono mean time. Uh, part of the reason they're very similar, apart from that temporal relationship is they both seem quite primordial. He essentially exists alongside Narfi and Nott here, who are Nyx and Erebus, the, the dark abyss and night uh, in the beginning of, of the world. And his children are, of course, the sun and the moon. So with so many connections to Cronus, I think it's, it's safe to actually correlate him with Capricorn. Uh, Capricorn is a sign of time and seasons. It takes place during January, the beginning of the year. There's many uh, Capricorn or Saturnian days that, that they have to do with death and rebirth, the beginning of time, the transition. He's also often conflated with Hyperion, who is another Greek deity that is said to be the parent of the sun and moon. His partner is Glaur. Her name essentially means glare or light shine and this is interesting because hyperion's partner is thea and thea is also a goddess of light and of precious metals the two of them are the parents of the sun and moon so i couldn't quite fit glower onto the uh, chart but i have her name right here as the partner with which she has mani and Sunna or soul thea like glower i would put in aquarius as something of an astral uh, mother. When it comes to Mani and Sol, Sonna is the Germanic name, uh, essentially English Germanic name. It's where we get the word sun in English from. I prefer to refer to it, her as Sonna because Sol is also a Roman male sun god. Sol Invictus, uh, essentially Helios. There are many, many myths around the world. The moon god and the sun goddess running across the sky. There's versions of it in Inuit, in Aboriginal, Sometimes the moon is chasing the sun. In this case, they're being chased by wolves, essentially wargs. And these two in particular ride chariots. And that's an important note that we'll probably get into, because horse-drawn chariots are a technology that you wouldn't see until after an early Indo-European influence. Of course, later Indo-European influence, you would see horseback riding, right? Because the first cases of using Horses on horseback in warfare would be by the Scythians, who used them in combination with the bow and arrow, actually. When we're looking at deities that are riding chariots, we're looking at a period probably between 3000 BC and 1200 BC. The sun god, or goddess in this case, is almost always Leo, and the Sol Invictus, and Helios, and Apollo as well would be uh, within the archetypes of Leo. And the moon god, or goddess, almost always is associated also with Cancer. Oh, I mentioned Nott and Narfi. Now, in the depiction I have here, Nott is the goddess of night riding the nightmare. Black horse is Narfi in many sources. And Narfi is said to be father of not so in a sense we have an implication almost of ancient animism where the animals are the most primordial proper name for this horse version of him is prim foxy it's even said that during the night his saliva that falls out of his mouth while he's riding across the sky becomes the morning dew essentially nightmare is a black horse it's a sort of omen of ill will and misfortune and there, he has an opposite, a white horse named Skinfaxi, who is ridden by another deity on this list, a uh, dog. What we see here with this deity, and then we will get the dog later, 
is they're on horseback. And that would imply that they might be a, a later edition from a Scythian or Balto-Slavic sort of influence. But of course, when it comes to uh, Nott herself, and even Narfi in theory, they don't need to have horses in order to have had a form. They probably did have a form before. Why? Because there are night goddesses throughout the world. In fact, uh, my hypothesis is that night goddesses might have been one of the first or oldest goddesses in any pantheon in the world. He said, almost in any pantheon, to be the first deity. You know, the night, the darkness, the void, the abyss before existence. And Narfi, as the masculine version of that, there's deities like Erebus and Scotus in Greek and Roman, who are essentially Erebus means the abyss. And they're, they're somewhat like Chaos, who's another, like Cronus, uh, an Orphic Greek deity. Chaos in the Greek sense means a void. In Greek, it's Chaos and Nyx that are together, and then Cronus is also there. Now, Nought is said to have three partners. The first partner is Nagalfari. The second partner is Aether. And the third partner is Delinger. There's a possibility that Nagalfari is the same as Narfi. It's maybe possible that Nagalfari is Mundulfari. It's also possible that Nagalfari is related to Nurgle, the god of darkness and death from the Sumerian pantheon, so implying a Middle Eastern influence. The night goddess largely, and also many Chthonic gods and goddesses, that means underworld gods and goddesses, tend to be aligned with Scorpio. Where would that Middle Eastern influence possibly come from? When we're looking at the Norse pantheon in general, I think we need to have a mindset of what cultural groups are mixing to form the Norse culture. We we're looking at some of these myths as being that of hunter-gatherers, either Eastern or Western hunter-gatherers, or most likely a mix of the two. They then mixed with Neolithic Middle Eastern Anatolians, and they in turn later mixed with several waves of Indo-Europeans. Three general groups. This is where being an interdisciplinary perspective helps. Many experts in Norse mythology also tend to be quite well versed in Indo-European mythology and Indo-European linguistics. And the tendency, unfortunately in my opinion, is to not look at other linguistic groups other than Indo-European. And Nagalfari or Nergal would be an example of looking into a linguistic group, Sumerian, that is considered to be unrelated to any other. However, if you look into the context of the Neolithic expansion, you understand that around 10,000 BC, in the Levant, farming and agriculture had been developed and started to spread out of there into the rest of Europe. Not merely a movement of technology and agriculture and knowledge as was once suspected, we have evidence now that this was a, a largely genetic component as well in the migration set. People were literally moving as far as southern Scandinavia, so Scania, and Jutland or Denmark and Zealand, the, the largest island in between the two. That, I think, is where the Middle Eastern influence in Norse comes from. So, coming back around to the Pantheon and the topic at hand, the other two husbands of not are another interesting case. Ethir, he's some kinds called Anar or other, and he's a Jotun or a uh, dwarf. In many of these primordial sources, Jotuns, dwarfs, and elves are kind of interchangeable, similar to the titans of the Greeks. They're essentially just meant to be a very old set of gods. From my comparative studies, I've found many deities that are related to this primordial ether. Uh, one is the Greek aether, um, which is where we get the term ether from, this idea of the ethereal or the um, airy spiritual energy, right? In general, aether means air. We see it in Syrian and Phoenician with ether, ether in Finnish. And essentially what it is is this great-great-grandfather of all gods, the first god, 
probably related to Ash and Ashur as well. Um, these are uh, Semitic and Hamitic deities. These are essentially sky gods or sky fathers. Then we have the other term here, Delangir. He's generally thought to just be a sky god of the day. He doesn't explicitly have too many solar connotations. It mostly has to do with the sky itself. In general, I think this deity also goes back quite far. Because there is, yet again, another Sumerian connection, Dingir. And Dingir in Sumerian is the word for a god or sky god for the day. And to me, this is too much of a coincidence to ignore. So Tengri is the Turkish, Mongolic uh, sky god. And Tian is the Chinese sky god. And it's very easily dismissed that there's any possible connection. We haven't yet discovered or put together the pieces with other languages to find out what possible other family group it might be a part of. There's a civilization called the Oxus civilization that is from Central Asia, and it existed alongside the Indus Valley civilization and the Elamite civilization and the Sumerians. We already have proven a link between the Dravidian language, which might have been the Indus River Valley's language, and the Elamite language, which regularly interacted with the Sumerians. And we've also found a link to some of the earliest Neolithic settlements in Iran around the Elamite area that have genetic relationship to modern Baluchs from Baluchistan. And since the Oxus civilization was seemingly so dependent on trade with the Indus and these other nearby places, they were probably the same people or in some way closely related and if those people had trade routes, anything like the Silk Road, we also know that the Han Chinese of the Yellow River had many West Asian resources with them eventually, implying, of course, that they traded with people who had cattle and had goats and sheep and grain from somewhere in the Middle East. This might have been the link, and there might have been a continuous culture ranging from the Elamites in the Indus Valley and the Oxus, all, all the way up to China, possibly in the regions of the Turkic peoples. And so I'm not exactly, you know, declaring that the Turkic and the uh, Dravidians are related, but I am suspecting and I am hypothesizing that that is a possibility. And if we see Dellinger in a Norse source, how do we explain that? Um, well, we might explain it as, again, some relationship to this Neolithic expansion, maybe even an older one to Eastern hunter-gatherers. Again, if there's some sort of relationship potentially between Altaic and Turkic peoples with the Finno-Ugric peoples, and we already know that Finno-Ugric influenced Norse, then it's possible that this Dingir is something that was come came along with Finno-Ugric and uh, Turkic and as an Eastern hunter-gatherer group idea. And what I decided to do with this deity is to conflate Dellinger and Ether because there's a lot of relationships with their children and their partners that seem to be similar. If we look at Aether in Greek and then Tengri and Dinger in other languages, we find an Aquarian sky father, sky god motif. Now, moving on from that, Alvaldi. I have him here. I didn't originally want to generate him because um, this entire generation above here is quite mysterious and unknown to us. We have both Thorn, which I'll mention later, and then Alvaldi. We just hear in Norse records that he's a grandfather of a whole lot of people. What we do know about him is that he was a dwarf or an elf. Again, in Norse, dwarf and elf, and even Jotun, um, are often conflated. And he's an example of all three in one. In some ways, his name even sounds like it. He's the original Allfather. He really is the father of all races, especially the elder ones, right? The oldest ones, the elves. He's sometimes shown as a sea god, and other times he's kind of a, a god king, uh, almost like a real historical person. This historical real person is associated with territories that are more Finnish. This might reinforce the idea I had here with Dellinger that there is, and Ether, that there is some sort of um, maybe Eastern hunter-gatherer or Finno-Ugric influence going on here. 
and Ether is in particular said to be his son. He's sometimes depicted as a merman, which is an odd addition of the sea god relationship. His name also, um, to me, speaks of a relationship to alder trees. And of course, it might just be the fact that he's an elf, and elf has to do with being elder, being eldar, you know, being, being old. But there is a motif of deities throughout Europe that are related to alder trees. Essentially, the, the Alder Man is another motif of it. I think there's a fantasy. There's Arvernus, who's the namesake of the Arverni tribe of, of Gauls, who appears to be this sort of wild deity. And then there's Lieb Olmai. Olvaldi is another name for, for Olvaldi. Lieb Olmai is a Sami shepherd god, and a god of the wilderness, and also of hunting. And he is associated with Alder trees. Sometimes he takes on the form of a bear. And that bear motif kind of relates it to characters like uh, Bear Stuck in uh, West Slavic, who is also a wild god of forests and wilderness, and is depicted as something of a dwarf. There's this Slavic Zillobog, who is kind of a wild god of vengeance. Um, he rebels against civilization. Throughout various pantheons around the world, there are like an Inuit, Tornitic, and uh, Nanuk. These uh, bear-like deities or men who have to do with the hunt and with with wilderness. In many ways, this motif is is similar to uh, Selvans um, or Silenus or Sylvanus, who's this Etruscan, Roman, Greek, uh, Illyrian deity who is a shepherd of the wilderness. And in the Etruscan example, quite fittingly, Etruscan being quite old religion pre-indo-european in europe he wears the hide of a bear and all of this also might relate to the idea of a berserker right um berserker comes from bear it's like embodying the the furiosity of a bear in in war you know embracing the wilderness within themselves my hunch uh is that he might have something to do uh with that old elvish sort of wild god one of his sons is Thiazi, who's a great eagle god. Really one of the only stories about him is that he abducts Idu, um, which is actually his sister, another child of Elvaldi, from her garden and steals her, her as well as her golden apples, the apples that provide immortality for the other gods. Loki and others have to go and get her back. I think Loki actually got her into that situation by leading her um, out of the garden or something. But Thiazi has somewhat of a animistic relationship, I feel. Again, to this very old pantheon, possibly Eastern hunter-gatherer, almost like a thunderbird um, in Amerindian. All the gods were actually terrified of him, and he was more powerful any, than any of them, and there's an implication that he was one of the original main most powerful deities. And he's also kind of similar to Aethon or Aeternus. Now, Aethon's the Greek, Aeternus is the Roman, essentially the eagle of Zeus. And the eagle of Zeus is said to be watching over Zeus and also working for Zeus. It is a separate entity. I tend to see the eagle as related to the Auriga constellation, and I don't have it as a cusp. I have it simply as a version of Aquarius, or a way to think of Aquarius as the eagle Auriga, and a way that I think about Zeus's eagle um, and many thunderbirds is uh, essentially Zeus's eagle is Aether, you know, Aethon, Aether, or Uranus, um, this Aquarian deity that is watching over his grandson and blessing him in, in the rulership of, of the world. Because, of course, Aether was the very first king of the gods, and he was usurped by Tartarus, the earth god who created the earth. And Tartarus was, in turn, usurped by Uranus. And then Uranus was usurped by Kronos, and then Zeus usurped Kronos. And so when you have that back and forth, you essentially have an alignment of uh, one force and the other force, a sort of uh, celestial chthonic, celestial chthonic, good, evil, good, evil. Um, according to the Greeks, the good would be the celestial, the evil would be the chthonic. That's why Kronos is demonized in Greek, whereas Zeus is a hero. And there's other pantheons where the thunder god who comes later is actually kind of a villain in uh, the Andes and in the in in the Muisca faith, you have the, the storm god trying to usurp the other god and actually 
fails because he's kind of a jerk. So it's a bit flipped on its head. Anyway, ab about Edun, her myth is very much like Eden. Uh, she watches over a garden, tends the garden for the production of golden apples. These golden apples are given to the other, the Aesir, and, and as guardians to make them immortal. Now, there's not much else we know about her. She doesn't come up in too many other myths. There's just this kind of tale of Theazi taking her, and they retrieve her back. Um, the interesting thing about that myth is it's Loki that deceives her to leave the garden she's picked up by Aethon. Loki kind of resembles Nahas, or the, the serpent of the garden, in that sense, deceiving um, Eve uh, out of the garden, in a way. And who else picks her up and tries to take her away than Theazi, who in many ways in um, Judeo-Christian mythology is associated with Yahweh, or associated with um, the, the good god. And Loki, of course, rescues or helps rescue Edun, um, bringing her back in the garden from the eagle. There's also the goddess Etain, or Edain, of the Dweatha Danan, Irish deities, who's quite similar. She's like a fertility deity of the summer. Both these kind of resemble the, the, the summer and the garden, or resembles this idyllic Eden-like like place. And Edun, because of her particular resemblance to Eve, and also to, I guess I didn't mention Persephone, um, also associated with fruits, in her case, pomegranate, which comes from a different region than apples do. Um, apples, by the way, are from Central Asia originally. So that's yet another piece of evidence as to uh, the hypothesis that, that these four deities descended from Albaldi might be of Eastern hunter-gatherer relationship direction in the East towards Central Asia, more so than towards um, Eastern Europe or Western Europe. And uh, there's a cusp sign that I have created between Taurus and Gemini for this motif, uh, Canuculus, uh, Lepus, and that's the constellation of the hare or the rabbit, the innocent youth of fertility and spring, uh, particularly the transition of spring into summer around May, which is when it takes place between uh, May and June. But Voland is the last of the group, and it's really interesting because Voland is treated as kind of a person um, he has very human-esque features. Um, he seems just like a very good smith, but he is in fact a deity. And in fact, if this is the case, where these deities are so primordial and related back to a very old uh, source, Voland would be a very old deity. Now, here's where it gets complicated, though. Uh, Voland is a smithing god. And smithing is not something that people did before the Neolithic very much. Um, it Essentially, smithing metals coincided with the spread of the Neolithic. It was one of the uh, package of innovations that the Neolithic people brought with them from the Middle East. You know, smithing copper uh, in the Chalcolithic. And the Chalcolithic was a transition between the Neolithic, where agriculture was being developed, and the Bronze Age, where, of course, uh, first they would start smelting copper, and then they found a way to take tin, uh, massive trade routes to get tin from other parts of the world, and put the two together and they made bronze, and that was a revolutionary technology. It revolutionized industry and warfare. The entire Bronze Age is based on that decision. We have Voland, who, if he's a very old deity, he would have to have gone back to no earlier than the Calcolithic, right? His humanistic character is probably also something of a remnant of the humorization of a real person, like one of the first smiths, who maybe he was hired. Uh, there is uh, some evidence for traveling smiths that would go into the courts of various chiefs and work for them. And this was like when it was an innovative thing to be a smith, to be uh, metalworking, they were incredibly valued. And another thing, copper has a very problematic effect on the psyche um, when you're inhaling copper and other byproducts of the metalworking process especially during the calcolithic it tends to drive you a little mad when we find deities like voland who are sometimes given stories involving going mad in his case um, he uh, sought retribution in a very kind of mad crazy way then we have an indication that this this might come from a very early interaction with the calcolithic with copper mining in 
and copper smithing in particular, and then bronze smithing eventually. And Voland isn't alone. There's another deity, Voltumna, of the Etruscans, again, I bring in, because they're a good example of a non-Indo-European culture that we can look at. Voltumna is the king of the gods in the Etruscan. Uh, he actually resembles Kronos more so than he resembles Zeus, and so this is an example of the, of the switch that might have happened. Voltumna is not only a god of fertility and the fruits and the seasons, but he was also a god of the underworld and smithing. And there are times when he takes on a maddening uh, persona. And a lot of his aspects probably evolved into Vulcan uh, and Vulcan and Sethlands, all these other deities of the Romans and Etruscans uh, related to volcanoes and such. Of course, volcanoes have an ultimately good effect on the fertility of, of soil around them. Um, even if they are disastrous in the short term. Which is a similar sort of uh, catch-22 with uh, like being a smith at a time. It comes with great wealth and power, but also madness. Perhaps Voland was something of a loan, a deity that came along with the practitioners of smithing in a period of mostly hunter-gathering, but transitioning into the Calcolithic into the Bronze Age. There is a very specific cusp sign that I have for smithing god deities, the cusp between Sagittarius and Capricorn, which is Vulpecula, the fox constellation. Like Prometheus, the fox is a very foxy and clever and cunning animal. Uh, many times foxes are associated with innovation, invention, and fire. So talking about Voland, there's another similar deity I want to kind of jump to over here, Surtur, where again he's considered a very primordial Jotun. In particular, a fire Jotun, and that isn't often getting as much attention as the, the, the ice Jotuns, like the, the ice giants, right? So there's fire giants and ice giants. Surtur and Ymir are opposites. They're basically twin brothers or brothers then, though. And Surtur, of course, has a lot of this connotation to what I was saying with Tartarus being this volcanic, chthonic deity of creation. Now, Surtur isn't really given such... A validating place as a god of creation, but he's certainly given a place in the underworld, certainly considered to be quite powerful in their pantheon. Like with Voland, I have another connection to the Etruscans. Again, the Etruscans being a Mediterranean, Neolithic people. We have two prominent deities in Etruscan that I can relate this to and are very fitting and interesting. One is Satyr, um, or Satra, and that is basically Saturn or Saturnus. It might actually be originally where Saturnus as a name and Saturn, the planet, comes from in Roman. It might have inherited from the Etruscans. Um, and they possibly inherited it, or it was related in some way to this Mediterranean Neolithic people of a satyr. And a satyr is a half man, half goat, right? Just like Pan. The goat and the half man, half goat has a very close relationship to the sign of Capricorn. Saturnus, Kronos, is definitely a Capricorn deity. In Etruscan, we find possibly what might be one of the oldest references to a very similar motif of Satan. I don't mean in a Christian Satan, but I mean the original Satan without any Christian influence. Satyr is an example in Etruscan of a deity that's considered to be the father, the banished Catholic father of the storm god, so basically the same as Saturn and Kronos. But Satyr also wields lightning himself, and fire as well. Lightning is often considered an aspect of fire, especially in astrology, for instance, by the way. That is somewhat in rebellion to what would be later Asgard, or Olympus, or what have you. Another connection um, in Etruscan that's a lot harder to try to um, make sense of is Suri. And Suri is a chthonic sun god of the Etruscans, and it's a very um, odd concept, but essentially what he is, is he's he's very much a version of Lucifer. Um, so it's interesting that in Etruscan you find um, an example of a, uh, of a demonized type of Satan and a demonized type of Lucifer coexisting. Um, and I, I figure it's probably not much of a coincidence, the area of the Renaissance where Lucifer was invented in Paradise Lost was by, you know, Italian Renaissance people living in the region of Tuscany, and Tuscany is the native territory of the Etruscans. So 
the idea that a sun god could be chthonic, that a sun god could be in the underworld, is not new. The Egyptians had it as well with Ra. Of course, Ra wasn't demonized, but Ra was said to pass uh, across the horizon into the underworld every night, and he would join in the underworld. In the underworld, he would join Set in defeating the cosmic serpent, essentially, the world serpent down there, and he would return victorious over the serpent every day. Surtur doesn't seem to have as much of a his heroic aspect, and he doesn't seem to have any particular sun connotation, that at least I can tell. Um, he has more to do with just Chthonic and fire. There is certainly a lot of volcanic aspects like Tartarus involved, and so I would be very tempted to put uh, Volpecula. It's also possible to put something like Ares because of relationships to fire gods like Agni of Hindu and Agnar. Um, there's another deity in Norse that's kind of obscure that might have to do with, um, might be related to Agni as a fire god. But because that exists in Norse already, I think there's no need to put Surtur in that category. And in general, Agni is not considered a Chthonic fire god. He's considered actually a celestial fire god. Uh, so Surtur, I think for me, it's definitely going to be another one that falls under the Volpecula category. I think that's probably the best that I can do. His Tartarus aspects are just kind of too strong for me to ignore. So Surtur is one of the first children of Nott and Ether, and it's it's somewhat controversial um, who their parents are. There's many different sources. Uh, most sources are blank on who they could be, but I found a few that say Ether is a parent of many of these original Jotun, and of course Nott is mostly always considered a parent of of many deities, but. Dellinger, the other version of Aether that I can play with him, is actually a parent of Dog. And of course, Dog is Day. It just means Day. It's actually very similar in concept to Dellinger, but um, in terms of his presentation, he is a youthful sun god, representing uh, not just the dawn, but the day cycle, youth and energy. Uh, and he is depicted riding a horse. Again, Skin Faxi, um, the opposite of Grim Faxi, uh, the Narfi dark nightmare. But Dog is very much like the Slavic Dajbog. And there are a few different Slavic and Scythian deities that have this course, his name means horse, the god of horses and of the sun. In the tarot, there is the sun card and it shows a uh, baby riding a horse and this is the same day this is dog actually dogda he represents the new sun on the new day right and there is a sort of many myths about dodge bog he dies and is resurrected uh and just like the sun every day and this is in some ways what happens to Ra, and also what happens to osiris in the egyptian myth it's certainly a myth that goes back very far, because when we're talking about myths that um, have any correlation with Egyptian, we're talking about Hamitic, which is a subset of Afro-Asian. And again, we're looking at that Natufians as a potential origin point of that myth, a pro byproduct of the Natufians and of, therefore of the Neolithic. But the horse we know could not have been Neolithic because we didn't ride horses like that until uh, the second wave of Indo-Europeans. Um, mostly Scythians. And that wave happened around around and leading up to 1000 BC. So there, there, there's also a possible connection with Dog and Dagda, and Dagda is this um, old Irish uh, deity considered to be the grandfather of the Irish deities, in particular the uh, Tuatha Dé Danann. And the Danann are the Indo-European migration of people into Ireland. The other groups, the Fomorians and such, seem to be uh, remnants of pre-Indo-European influence. And again, there might have been another wave in bef before this Celtic wave, because the Gaelic would be a Celtic wave. And we do think it's the Gaels, or the Caledonians, that came in um, with Celtic uh, Indo-European influence to bring deities like Dagda and the other Tuatha Danann. In Danu in general, Danu possibly having to do with the Danube River, Danubian River being the homeland of the Celts and uh, the Dacothracians, for instance. 
And Dagda also in his myth has more of an association with winter and he's often conflated with a lot of Saturnian, um, almost satanic themes uh, because of that January time period, the new year uh, change over the seasonal stuff. Uh, he's said to have stopped the sun and he's a harbinger of, of the winter, but is himself something of a, of a sun god that dies and is re resurrected, or at least he, he kills and then resurrects the sun in a sense. Dog is much younger, and many of the Scythian deities are, are, are much younger, but Dogda, um, because later Irish tradition, I think, um, saw him as the spreader of Indo-European uh, culture into Ireland, he's considered a grandfather of those later Indo-European deities. And again, when we see Sun God, what do we, what do we think? We think it's most likely a Leo connection. And Yord, essentially, her name means world, and she is the Earth. She's the Earth Mother, so she's very much like Terra and Gaia, Greek and Roman sources, just the Earth Mother is another motif um, I've talked about many times. I have a whole video about it, as with the Night Goddess, that goes back very, very far, and almost every culture on Earth has one. And for that, there's not actually much about her. We don't know much about um, her background. We know that she's probably a child of either Nott and Delinger or Nott and Ether, and to me that's the same. So Earth Mother in all pantheons is associated with the Earth, and the Earth is associated with Taurus. Now, while we're talking about Taurus, we want to talk about another Earth Mother of the Norse. Cattle were domesticated in southeastern Anatolia, around the city of Tarsus around the Taurus Mountains. And the Taurus Mountains in southern Anatolia are named for Taurus, not only a constellation, but for cows. And then from there, that population of domesticated cattle spread and traded throughout Europe and Asia. I've looked into quite extensively the history of crops and domestication. And just like how it's important to recognize that the Neolithic spread as a genetic in, and linguistic influence and not only a technological or industrial one, it's important to recognize that all domestic animals that have deities associated with them are inherited from a specific people in a specific time who had originally domesticated that animal. Crops and animals are a little bit different because you can trade them. They can spread kind of exponentially, essentially just by local people trading with other local people and it just spreads out, radiates naturally. One mistake of specializing in Indo-European language that I've noticed is when you see something like the cattle goddess, like Autumn Bois, the assumption you make is that, oh, it's from Indo-European because the Indo-Europeans had a very prominent cattle culture and had their own cattle goddesses. Logically, yes, that could be the case, that could be why, but it's equally probable that the Neolithic people who first spread cattle culture into Europe spread their version of the cattle goddess and cattle culture to the substrate of Norse culture. Since this is such a primordial deity, um, it probably was brought there originally by Neolithic people who had cattle. So Autumn Blah in the myth is kind of inexplicably there. Uh, she begins licking the ice off of Buri. And Autumn Blah slowly licks him out. It takes three days. Ymir also at that time is breastfed by Autumn Blah, essentially adopted. And so she's essentially a mother to both of them, although not explicitly stated to be a mother of anyone. She isn't explicitly told to have had parents or anything. Uh, sometimes she's considered to have originated after Ymir. Uh, and all of that kind of indicates that there was some cattle culture that uh, brought this cow mother to prominence. And mind-blowing thing about Norse myth here is there's a, there's a recognition that the lands that they live in were once occupied entirely by glaciers during the Ice Age. Sure, perhaps they were more local and they had to do with the different fjords and the different um, glacial valleys throughout Scandinavia that still exist. We also know that people were actively living on the footsteps of the glaciers in Europe 
and even in the, in the Americas and everywhere around the world, I suspect that Yord and Autumnbla might be very closely related. A lot of depictions have depicted Autumnbla as essentially a bull, as a male with big bull horns. But one, she's being milked by Ymir, so female. Two, her name means hornless cow that gives milk. So she doesn't have horns, like many hornless female cows. Now there are there are female cows that can have horns, but largely female cows don't have horns. Male cows have horns. Now Ymir, um, he's another one that is sometimes said to be a child of of Ether and and not, and other times is said to have just always been there. He's just kind of been there. I mean, the world is made by him using his body parts. So you would presume he'd be quite primordial, because where was the world without him? But nonetheless, certain sources I find he is, he does have parentage, and it's the same parentage as other very primordial deities, like his brother Surtur, and I think his sister Yord. There's an interesting dynamic of these three. Of course, you have this chthonic fire giant, you have the earthy ice giant, Ymir, and then you have the Earth Mother, Yord. And there's a male counterpart to Yord that is essentially her brother or her, her other aspect, and that's Fjorgin. And Fjorgin is, of course, with, with one N, is, is another name for Yord, but there is a male counterpart with two Ns. To me, Fjorgin and Ymir ought to be the same. Ymir has precedence in many cultures. Uh, in Chinese, for instance, this is a great example, Pengu. And Pengu is this great big giant man who stomps around the world and creates lakes with his feet and, ri and drinks rivers dry and bursts out of the earth almost like a volcanic force. There's a lot of a lot of him that's kind of actually like Tartarus as being an earth maker, right? But of course, we have Surtur here as basically the Tartarus version, but the aspects of Tartarus that is the uh, the world turtle almost the tar tortoise the the tortoise the the large behemoth that creates the world and whose body is gigantic uh even atlas has some aspects of this i'm from minnesota i mean maybe you could tell from my vikings on the shirt here that i fittingly wore for my norse video we have a large percentage of norwegian uh people who live in minnesota and because of that, there are a few folk tales in Minnesota that have very direct Norse sources. One such one is Paul Bunyan. He's a giant earth maker. Um, there's two lakes that kind of look like butt cheeks, essentially, and the idea is that he stepped, down, he sat down there um, to rest, and that's how those lakes were made. And there's all sorts of little myths of him going around, you know, chopping down forests. Uh, you know, taking aspects of the Norwegian pioneer Americans and blending that with the idea of Ymir. And Ymir uh, is often accompanied by Anumbla. Paul is depicted with his his cow, or bull, babe. And there's the same amount of ambiguity as with Anumbla's depictions about whether babe is male or female. But because it's a more modern myth, there's an equal amount of people saying it's male as there are saying it's female. My vote is that it's female to be in line with the true original pagan roots, but glaciers have affected Minnesota as well. And so there's precedence to have a sort of similar uh, Ice Age mythology about the region. Now, the other thing about Ymir that I have to mention is another um, special, many specialists in Indo-European would point out that his name sounds like Yama, and the Proto-Indo-European reconstructed Yimo. And Yima is Iranian, Yama is Hindu. There's even the hypothesis that uh, Remus in Romulus and Remus is related to Yimo, uh, the one twin that is killed. Right, so Romulus kills Remus, and Rome's named after Romulus, or so they say. Uh, that myth is an Italic myth. It's a, 
Indo-European influence myth. There might have been versions of it that were before uh, the Italian people got uh, Italy and settled lands that were once occupied by the Etruscans, I say again. The Etruscans, originally Rome, is named after Ruma, and Ruma actually resembles Audumbla and Yort. Uh, this is kind of cattle goddess. This idea of the twins, and one twin kills the other twin or sacrifices the other one. In Norse myth, it's Odin, Vili, and Ve that kill Ymir to make the world, and so that implies that there's a good amount of time that Ymir is wandering the world uh, between generations that they actually decide to, to kill him. Now, there is no mono counterpart to Ymir in the Norse myth, not really. The closest we can get to what Mana would be, and Mano's being the first twin, uh, man, and he's named Mano Man because he is the first man. Perhaps Buri is this man because he's the one that uh, survives and the one that has a lineage, that lineage ultimately leading to Odin and Vili who kill Ymir. But it is not Mano who kills Ymir, it's not Buri who kills Ymir. It's his lineage, I suppose, but it's not him personally. Now, there, there is an aspect of what I was talking about with Tartarus, of the Tartarus, the word, world turtle, the world maker, the demiurge, like Surtur, being banished to the underworld and thus becoming Chthonic and coming, becoming evil. There's something about that with Ymir where, like, um, in the Norse myth, he's not really said to continue to exist after that point. He is killed and chopped up in order to make the world. But... To, to one interpretation, you might be able to say, oh, maybe Ymir, when he died, became Surtur, became the fiery Chthonic deity. I don't know. Um, you could have that interpretation and therefore see him as Tartarus. And maybe then you could justify some of, of this story. So, because of all these world-shaping motifs and because of his dynamic with Fjord, I actually consider him to be a Taurus now, Buri is interesting, and I've conflated Buri and Burr. Uh, Buri and Burr are father and son. Uh, Buri is the one who's licked out of the ice. Burr is the father of Odin. There's not much we know about Burr under, other than that he is a god of winter and of cold and ice. And that much would be understood by somebody descended from someone who was licked out of the ice and glaciers and has this ice age kind of connotation to him. But um, their names are so similar and the lineage is so broken that I made the uh, unilateral decision, at least for this, to conflict them or at least to consider them to be gods of winter. So um, also because they resemble Boreas. And uh, Boreas is a Greek, uh, he actually descended from a Thracian, source, so again we have that connection to the Pannonian second wave of Indo-Europeans into Europe, deity. And Boreas represents the cold northern winds and winter and, and uh, snow, essentially, to the Greeks. And there's another aspect of his name that I think um, is it, it's interesting to consider him as the founder or the namesake of Hyperborea. We talked about Mondofari being like Hyperion, and Hyperion being essentially a sun god, then we might consider that Hyperborea is a combination or maybe a meeting of two dynasties, the sun deities with the, uh, the cold ice winter deities. The sun deities and the winter deities come together. There's a lineage over here of deities that have more of a potentially Neolithic background, and I told you that the sun god of Dog might go back further to a Neolithic source, kind of like Ra and Osiris, and those deities tend to be more solar and more fertility and less cold, less death. It's possible in a way to see the marriage of Buri and Besla as the creation of the kingdom of Hyperborea. I like to think of the meeting of Buri and Besla being the Neolithic Mediterranean uh, solar worshipping people migrating up into the cold wastes. And when we consider that there are 
presumably forces that are melting and heating the glaciers that Buri is being born out of. And we also see that Audumbla, a cattle goddess, a goddess coincidentally associated with Neolithic people from a sunny region, Anatolia, is the one that's licking Buri out. It is implied, I think, that these hunter-gatherers were in some ways influenced by uh, Neolithic uh, solar worshipping people. The union of these two people creates the Aesir. And that's interesting because, like I said, I said earlier that the Vanir are generally can very safely be considered to be Neolithic descended deities. And the Aesir sometimes are conflated with Indo European. But it's not that simple because we can see right here in this lineage, it might go back to a meeting of Neolithic and hunter gatherer groups. Very, I put the icy winter deities in Pegasus. Uh, Pegasus also as a sign as a constellation as a mythical creature represents the clouds. Now when we talk about Besla, we have very little to work on. The only real aspects that are given her is that she's kind of a representative of marriage. Again, this, this different group, uh, children of Bolthorn and the Buri. He doesn't have a parentage, he's kind of a wild man of a sense. He's, he's essentially being, being civilized. So there's this motif, potentially, and again, this is getting into speculation, and it's also looking at other mythologies, taking from their stories and, and, and kind of projecting or importing them into Norse here to say, well, you know, Besla doesn't have any characteristics, but perhaps what she represents is domestication or otherwise civilization, uh, cultivation. And for that, when we're looking at deities with that sort of connotation, we might look for uh, goddesses of the hearth, uh, goddesses of civilization, like Vesta or Hestia in uh, Greek and Roman sources, or even Brigid in Irish. It would make sense that a uh, partner of this cold deity, Burr, would be a warm hearth deity. In a lot of pantheons, there is a very prominent goddess of the hearth and, and, and of fire. We have a very prominent one in Scythian, in Slavic, and in Finno-Ugric, and in Turkic. We don't really have one in Norse. There's not an explicit deity in Norse that is a fire goddess of the hearth. But I think Besla has probably the most potential to be classified like this. That archetype I put in the cusp between Leo and Virgo. And I call it Corona. If you think it's weird to intentionally name something after a virus, well, um, there's another sign called Cancer, so uh, touche. Another deity I don't have on this chart that is potentially also a brother of Besla and a, and a son of Bolthorn would be Halogi or Logi. And I'll talk about them when we get to Loki, but he's generally a god of heat and fire. And he's very important because he might have been one of the instigators of the melting of the glaciers. That myth is essentially lost to us. And when we look at the dynamic there between a fire god, Logi, and Besla not having much characteristics, we can maybe imply that Besla had fiery characteristics as well. Besla's uh, mysterious father of many names is Bolthorn. Bolthorn is even more scarcely understood than Elvadi, and that's even more reason why I didn't show him, but just kind of said that they were children. So he's certainly important because Besla, Mimir, Aegir, and Yord are all uh, his children. All we really know about him is his name means Evil Thorn. I have also been the name of a king of Gotland, Venland, and Finland. He's potentially a son of Snare, who's a god of snow, another kind of obscure one that I don't bring into the, the grouping here. But there's really kind of a chaotic line, both with Elvaldi and Bolthorn more so, uh, circle of <laughs> parentage, where, um, uh, you know, Snare might be a parent of Bolthorn, but Snare's parents are said to be Frosty and Aegir, and yet Aegir is said to be a child of Bolthorn, so uh, Frosty's said to be a child of Aegir, I think, too. Uh, there's really nothing for me to work with. Perhaps Bolthorn is the same as Elvaldi, I don't know. Elvaldi also has some Finnish connections. 
what we do know about him is that his children are Hilaire, which is another name for Aegir, uh, Halogi, or that we mentioned, uh, Logi, the fire god, Kari, who is a Norse wind god of the north wind, and I conflate him with Njord, a uh, god of the north wind as well, and then also Besla and Mimir. As far as Mimir goes, uh, again, we can indicate that he had some magical powers and wisdom because he is the one who taught the magic songs to Odin, and every connotation that Odin has with magic will have been therefore inherited by Mimir. He is an old god of wisdom. What is that? That's a wizard. That's what a wizard means. It's an elder, wise uh, being or deity. Often shamanic in some sense, uh, priestly in other senses, and having to do with magic in more. Now, words, speech, and magic are all very closely connected in Norse, and that's, you know, basically the roots of what magic means in the Western European sense. Words hold a certain magical power, and this is true to the Druids of the Celtic cultures as well. In, in my estimation, the Druidic themes of the Celts are probably descended from the same root as these magical themes in Norse, from Mimir and Odin as well. It could even be, you know, shamanic source in the hunter-gatherers western or eastern that influenced the Norse and the Celts. Mimir is, of course, often depicted as a head that talks and is usually hanging off of the belt of Odin. Because, according to the myth, Mimir was martyred in the creation of humankind. His blood essentially became part of the creation of humans and became part of the reason that we are wise and intelligent and why we have the capacity for magic. And Odin, being his nephew and having a close connection with him, essentially saved his head and uh, took it with him. And the head continued to be alive and speak and advise Odin going forward into the rest of Odin's myths. And Odin is often, you know, mostly said to be a wise god, essentially a wizard of his of his own. In my understanding is that Mimir is most of Odin's wisdom, or a good amount of his wisdom. It's Mimir that's the wisdom that makes Odin wise. And Odin himself has a bunch of other um, ideas about him. Sure, wisdom is something that he learned and gained, but when it comes to speech and magic and intellect and wisdom, that is mostly Mimir speaking, I like to think. Now, this myth of a wise deity being killed, martyred, in order to create humankind with their blood, thus imprinting on humankind intelligence of a god, goes way back to Middle Eastern sources again. We can see with deities like Geshtu of the Sumerian and Ilawela of Akkadian, was a god of intellect and willpower, a wise old man in his own right. He was sacrificed by the Sumerian gods to create humankind. And that particular undertone there, it's often mentioned in the Anunnaki. Anunnaki are just the primary deities of the Sumerian pantheon. Humans are created as slaves to do the gods' work so that they don't have to. It's probably an indication of uh, the kind of normalized slavery and caste systems that were around. Um, during the Sumerian and Bronze Age periods, especially in the Middle East. But nonetheless, there's this aspect of uh, humans being given some special wisdom, some special intellect and guidance. And this Geshtu um, and this, this Elder uh, also might have some relation to Geron or Charon, the old man, who, you know, in the, in the Greek and Roman myths is portrayed ferrying the dead across the river Styx in the underworld. The insinuation there being if Mimir, uh, after he is martyred, he's essentially given the task of fearing the dead in the underworld. So Mimir, apart from being like a wizard, almost like Merlin, um, is also similar to the Celtic deity Ogma. And Ogma is this pan-Celtic god of speech and knowledge and wisdom, and also memory, because again, the Druidic practices are very preoccupied with memory and the ability to 
recite poetry in an eloquent way and to teach by oral tradition and to reject writing. With a wizard motif, wisdom, we have Gemini, who is quite often associated with gods of wisdom. Whether old, like Mimir and Geshtu, or young, like Hermes, Mercury. And even when we look at Hermes and Mercurius, they're given the task of burying the dead into the underworld, and they pass the dead on the river Styx to Charon to be taken across. And to some extent, you might think of this elder Charon as kind of an elder version of, of Mercury. Of course, Mercury, being less chthonic, is taking people through the sky as ghosts kind of down into the underworld, and he leaves them basically at the doors of the underworld. Mercury is more celestial. Charon is more chthonic. And this is, again, implying that there's an older generation of deities that may be demonized or forgotten or dead that become chthonic, like Mimir. And there's a younger set of deities uh, in later versions of the Pantheon that are celestial and they're allowed to roam free as young, youthful energies. Next, I want to talk about Njord. I see him as a, a, a north wind god, kind of like Boreas again, but distinct enough from Burr uh, because he has more oceanic connotations. He's kind of a sea god, wind god, storm god, but like particularly sea storm, not necessarily lightning, thunder. In general, his name has to do with the north and is the namesake of the Norse themselves in Norway. And he's generally considered to be the first of the Vanir. And the two different Norse gods in Asgard are the Aesir and the Vanir, and they were once at war. The Aesir came into where the Vanir were, conquered them, and integrated them into their own uh, family, into Asgard, essentially. And so Njord must be some reference to an old sea god, or god of the north, that was the primary deity of the Vanir. Based on what the Vanir tend to represent, which is uh, solar fertility sort of ideas, likely they were Neolithic. And so Njord we're looking at a deity that might be a Neolithic sea god. Perhaps something like Poseidon, perhaps something like an older sea god like Nereus, Nere still meaning sea, you know, similar to Mare. There's the Egyptian Nu, um, which, you know, is a bit of a stretch, but he is a, he's the god of the abyssal ocean, you know, that before the dawn of creation. Nord is also similar a little bit to Lear again, which I've said is actually similar to Aegir, and as brothers, this is where it gets complicated. Aegir and Njord sometimes have the same children, or, you know, of course they have some, the same parentage. Uh, sometimes they're conflated with one another, and it gets a little confusing to tell the difference. They're both generally like sea gods, and they're both in some older pantheon group. He's explicitly said to be the king of the Vanir, and for that reason, often gets conflated with Saturnus uh, Kronos, because there's this idea that the, that the Aesir are like the Olympians, and the Vanir are like the titans, you know, if we're conflating Greek onto it. That's kind of a popular thing to do, but in my mind it's it's quite a stretch. There's not too much that Njord himself has in common with the idea of Kronos. Um, there's no Chthonic elements to him. He isn't really banished um, when defeated, per se. He is oceanic rather than earthy at all. Uh, Kronos is very earthy, in fact, has to do with the fertility of the land most times. That's why he has a scythe. He, he could be something like a Kronos that's more sea-related, although Aegir, I think, is more like Kronos and yet still sea-related. Or he could be like Poseidon or Nereus, just a sea god that, again, would have been quite prominent to Mediterranean people who were spreading throughout Europe. I don't see it as much. Now, I do see it, however, in another persona that is probably the same character, or at least occupying the same space as king or founder of the Vanir, that Njord is, and that's Gilfi. And Gilfi is a fairly obscure, but not completely unknown, Norse Jotun. He's a very wealthy king of the Vanir, 
who, upon hearing about the Aesir, actually goes to Asgard to ask about them, because he's curious about them, because he's concerned that they might, you know, take over and fringe on his his prosperity uh, during his golden age. And this this is very similar to someone like Kronos. It is explicitly said to have watched over a golden age, and we know because of the historical context of Kronos being a Neolithic deity that the golden age that is referred to by the Greeks and in this case is essentially referred to by Gilfi and the Vanir is the Neolithic or perhaps all the way into aspects of the Bronze Age. When he goes to Asgard, Odin actually plays a trick on him. He transforms into three kings sitting on three different thrones that are all kind of stacked on top of each other. Uh, one's Har, one's Hafnar, and one's 3D. And essentially it's a uh, high just as high and third and it's kind of funny because the high is on the bottom he's not the highest one it's, it's just it's essentially a joke odin there's a lot of norse uh, stories that kind of have a joke to them they're they're funny odin plays tricks on people sometimes loki plays trick on people even thor plays on they're, they're all very humorous and this is one kind of funny example where um odin's kind of hiding the fact that he's an aesir and that he's odin uh, into all these personas and they start doing riddles and telling stories with this gilfy chronos like figure who is trying to learn about the aesir but is telling stories and kind of riddling back and forth with them to try to try to learn he himself actually pretends to be someone named gangleri a totally different person odin in this form is able to kind of uh prophesy the fall of the vanir and the rise of the aesir as though he's an oracle to uh, the very person he's going to usurp. And another another kind of obscure deity that has to do with fortune and wealth at this particular period, or at least probably in this particular period, is Odir or Othir. We know that he was definitely a fortune god of prosperity, and he probably represented a golden age of some kind. This makes him probably very similar to Gilfi, but also possibly to Aegir or to Nord, particularly Aegir or Gilfi, because Nord is not explicitly said to be a wealthy fortune deity, but Aegir, uh, Odir, and Gilfi are all said to be. Odir, or Othir, is actually said to be a child of Nott and Nagelfari. It would make Othor in the same generation as Njord and Aegir, but not necessarily a son of Bolthorn. Gilfi's actual wife is Gefshin. And Gefjun or Gefjun is a plowing goddess associated with cattle. And so again, we have that cattle goddess motif getting in there. So this is a Neolithic queen. And the main Neolithic queen, say Kronos' wife, would be Rhea. And uh, Saturnus' wife would be Opus. Rhea is a goddess of grains and that kind of agriculture. Of course, when you're plowing the field, you're getting ready to put grains. But to plow the fields, you need oxen. And Gifjun's associated with oxygen. oxen gives her kind of a cattle connotation too. When you're plowing, it implies both a cattle culture and a grain culture. Golveg, as the explicit wife of Njord, is the mother of Frey and Freya. And even Frosty, who I mentioned. And Frosty is kind of, he's basically Jack Frost, I guess. He's... And Goldveg's name means gold drunk. So there's an implication here by the victorious, in this case the Aegir, that she was somehow maybe corrupt or like over wealthy um, or spoiled. Especially since in the myth she is brutally martyred three times by the Aesir. And she goes to, I think, Asgard to meet with them. They show extreme prejudice towards her and impale her on a spike and then burn her over a fire and she didn't die she was resurrected once twice and then three times and her third form heath who i have down here would stay around she literally transformed into another deity my suspicion is that uh, the other two forms that she was reborn into might have been something like freya and frigga um, both being very similar names and also both stemming from this maternal trinity goddess figure. 
of course, it's not like every time she was reborn, another person walked out of the fire and was, was born. But since she is considered the mother of Freya, and Freya is sometimes conflated with Goldbeg or vice versa, I figure, like, it's kind of a fun spin on the myth. So she, as well as Heath, the witch, are kind of like a triple deity. Again, Gefjun is probably synonymous with her to some degree. And also Fulla. Fulla or Vulla was an attendant of Freya. And she's the one who always listens to Freya and keeps her secrets. Fulla's name is very much related to the Proto-Indo-European Plithwi or Prithvi or Blide. And it basically full, fill, filled. It means abundant, right? And that's actually related to um, Opus, who, again, I says the Roman counterpart of Kronos. And Opus, Ops, essentially comes from Copia. And copia means like copious, like copious amounts, abundance. And copia is associated with the cornucopia. Um, copia being the goddess, the corn being a horn. And that's the symbol of Thanksgiving in the United States of the big horn. Usually it's weaved in the U.S., but like it's generally a horn that uh, houses a bunch of fruits and vegetables. And, you know, opus is portrayed that way, abundant. Abundita is portrayed that way. So full all represents, you know, being full, being abundant, being rich. This, again, obviously is a very clear indication of Goldveig as well, as being a very wealthy and abundant queen. Again, very much Goldveig and Gilfi, Kronos and Rhea, the Aesir, presumably a later group, came into this prosperous group and martyred them, killed their grain goddess, their, their queen, and transformed her into a younger deity. This is also what happened in Greece to some extent, although Rhea is not explicitly abused by Zeus. He's actually, she's actually considered to be saving Zeus um, so that she can be avenged against Kronos for killing her children. But Rhea kind of doesn't appear again in a lot of Greek myths. She just disappears. And in her place is Demeter, one of her daughters, presumably. The truth is that Rhea and Demeter and Opus and all these deities are really descended from the same deity, and that is the seated mother, Kabele, Kubaba. I've talked about it in many of my videos, especially the fertility goddess video here. Go look at it if you want to learn more. Wheat is not something that cropped up everywhere in the world. It, it was a crop that was domesticated in a particular place and spread out from there, right? The same thing happened with the deity of grain. And same thing happens with corn that was developed and domesticated in a particular area in Mesoamerica and spread out from there. And there's corn deities that are the same, stem from the same exact deity throughout the Americas. Every major crop usually has a major deity associated with it. And before I tell you what all these three are um, in terms of astrology sign, I'm going to talk about Scotty first. Because Scotty is another wife of Njord. He had two wives. Scotty was his wife that he didn't get along with, and they barely ever saw each other. And it's something of like a Calypso or Davy Jones situation, where Njord was always away. He was always, I guess, king, and Scotty lived out in the mountains. Basically just wanted to live on her own. And she wouldn't have anything to do with civilization. And it's very interesting. So Scotty represents the wild woman. She represents more of the mountainous fortune and herding and goats and shepherding. Whereas Gullveig is more of the domesticated, uh, civilized, grounded, agricultural deity. And so he had two wives, one representing kind of a shepherd culture, the other representing a, a settled culture. One representing maybe hunter-gatherer even more so, and the other one uh, agricultural. She rebels against Njord and Gullveig so much that she joins Odin and even has some children with Odin at some point as well. Scotty, however, is actually um, daughter of Thiazi, and it's an interesting and obscure kind of connection, because Thiazi, again, isn't really stated to have done much outside of abducted Edu, and have been a big powerful deity in his own right at some point. And if Scotty isn't hunter-gatherer related explicitly, I would think she's a transition between the two with the shepherd culture, and particularly that of goat herding. And why Scotty isn't always explicitly depicted as a goat herding mountain woman, but there is a precedence 
throughout mythology of this motif. Dali in Georgian mythology and Svedetian mythology in the Caucasus has a mountain goddess of wild animals and oaths and the hunt and she is always betrayed with with goats and takes on the form of a goat as an animagus. This I think is also similar to Glaistig, the green maiden of Scottish myth is kind of a ghost that takes on the form of like a goat hybrid, almost like a female satyr. Might even be related to Skatha or Scotia, who sounds a lot like um, Scotty in, in a way, the namesake of Scotland, as something of a, of a powerful wild woman. Uh, Skatha and Scotia are kind of war goddesses, but it could be that this this wild geistig, strong female mountaineer woman took on the characteristic of a political uh, liberator. Uh, in the context of, of Scotland, because when we're talking about the Scottish people, we're talking about a people that is a blend of Gaelic and English. So a bunch of Germanic Anglian people migrating up and into Scotland. At that time, Alaba or Caledonia, owned by you know Caledonia, Galadonia, Galadonia is what it means. The Gaels are living there, and they're mixing with the Gaels, and so they might take some maybe Gaelic traditions. And maybe some of their own Norse traditions of like Scotty and uh, even Bertha or Birchta, who is a goddess of cold and the snow and winter and mountains. Scotty is quite often associated with skiing. And a lot of times when I see people talking about Scotty, they, there's none of what I'm talking about. Like a, a, a comparative mythological analysis would show that she has very much precedence throughout Europe and the world of this goat mountain lady <laughs> right but when you just look at the records from a norse perspective it's like oh she's a god of ski goddess of skiing and she's kind of out there in, in the mountains and they just depicted with skis like modern skis not the best depth i'm gonna say at least bertha birchda also associated with winter there's a lot that's similar about them as kind of old sometimes they're portrayed as like old crone mountain women as well that's possible. And that relates them to some degree also with Amalthea or Malthea, who's a Minoan or Greek mountain goddess who also is depicted as a female goat. And she's also the stepmother of Zeus. So when Zeus was left by Rhea in the wild, uh, guess who picked him up and raised him? It was Amalthea. And that's another interesting connection here because I know we mentioned Rhea and Kronos. And so if Gilfi and Gulveig are Kronos and Rhea, then Scotty being the other wife of Kronos is an interesting thing. You know, Malthia being the other wife of Kronos is a very interesting twist, implying again this dynamic between the rural highlands kind of shepherd culture that has a big difference of opinion with the settled agricultural valley culture, right? When it comes to Gulveig, although there is the kind of RSC connotations having to do with the plowing and the cow. It's for the purpose of farming grains, and Gulveig in particular is more related to the seeded goddess like Ceres, like Demeter. And Ceres and Demeter are associated with Virgo, and Virgo is like the the grain farming the agricultural motif, even the virgin is holding Como Berenices, which is not originally hair, but actually a bundle of wheat. So her opposite, therefore, um, there's aspects of Golveg and Opus and Abundatia and Cornucopia that, for instance, are explicitly Capricorn. Capricorn actually is related symbolically to the abundance of the Cornucopia, you know, fortune, wealth. And that's part of why Gilfi, Kronos, uh, and so on are very Capricornian energies. Gulveig, to some extent, also has that Capricornian energy. Both Virgo and Capricorn have some connection to the agricultural goddess. For the sake of the goat connotations with Scotty and the kind of wild aspects of it, let's give Scotty Capricorn. And Yord, um, although it is extremely hard, we could say Pegasus because he's like Boreas, but he's not. He's too settled, he's too oceanic, really. And I think for the sake of diversity, because I have a hunch on where I would like Aegir to be, I think Njord could simply be Pisces. So now let's talk about Aegir. So a lot of 
what I'm going to say about Aegir, I probably already said. But he is often conflated with Njord and Gilfi and Othir, Odir, a uh, wealthy god. And in part, that's because Aegir is associated with wealth and fortune, as well as the sea and storms like Njord is. And so he's kind of a catch-all of all of it. In some ways, you can just conflate it all into Aegir. And I was tempted to just throw Njord and Aegir into one category. But then I would have Ran, Scotty, and Golveg, and it would be it would get kind of unwieldy. But also they have somewhat separate lineage. And as you can see down here, Njord and Golveg are parents of Frey. And Frey marries uh, another family. That other family, uh, being Gertha's parents are Aegir and Ran uh, be the same, and she, he was marrying his own sister, you know, it wouldn't really be that comfortable. I know that that happens in mythology, but I try to make it unhappen when I can. So Aegir also has a connotation of alcohol and festivity, and so there are almost Dionysian aspects of him. And Dionysius and Bacchus are not far from sea gods. Uh, Bacchus is even said to have voyaged across the world to, to spread his, his cult. Dionysus traveled the world, he traveled to India, you know, like, living life to the fullest. That's a Dionysian uh, idea, and so a lot of me actually wants to think of Aegir in that sense. There's Deucalion of Greek sources, who I presume probably had to do with the Black Sea Flood, was said to be a survivor of the Flood, and after that, just like Noah, cultivated wine. Another connection to that energy is something like Pan. Pan is also a deity that kind of just lives in the moment and is a bit of a wild man. He's definitely not as civilized as Aegir probably was, being potentially one of the Vanir. He's not explicitly said to be, so I didn't put him as that. Pan is a satyr, and once again, a satyr is associated with the goats. It's a half-goat man, and they kind of live for the moment. They're a bit wild. They do what they want to do. Another satyr by the name of Silenus actually joins Dionysus on his journey to India. In Japan, the Ptolemaic Egyptian kind of synthesis of Osiris and Pan and Dionysus, Kronos to some degree, he is a version of Pan that transformed into a sea goat in order to defeat Typhon when even Zeus ran away. I've told this myth in a few different things like my Titan video. Hey, Japan is certainly one of my favorite deities. There's certainly plenty of overlap between the characteristics of, of Aegir and, and A Japan. Both presumably must have been heroes if they are great kings. Um, they both have sea connotations. Both of their names, Aegir, uh, Aegir, have a connection to the word for goat, primarily a goat, but is willing to take on the part of aspects of fish in order to do work in order to get shit done, basically. And that's a very Capricornian, you know, cardinal way of dealing with things. So whatever they have to do to win, to succeed, they, they're willing to, to undertake it. This is also part of what Shiva represents in the Hindu pantheon, the important masculine energy to cultivate. Now, Aegir is very much related to Lear of Irish and Welsh sources. And the, the biggest smoking gun is the Germanic name for uh, Aegir, most likely, is Aguijaz, Aqua, the god of water, and in that case also rivers. I, I f often feel like Aguijaz is opposed to Ingwaz, and Ingwaz is another name for Frey, by the way. It's actually the namesake of the English Anglian people. They're named after Frey. Frey represents the land fertility, and Aguijaz represents this kind of um, water and ocean and sea and river fertility. Another hard evidence that he is much more oceanic than uh, Landy is that he has nine daughters who are considered waves. They're essentially nine waves. They're almost something like the Atlantides, who are actually seven, which is more the Pleiades than nine. Pleiades is seven, but the Atlantides are the children of Atlas, and Atlas you know, Atlantis. He's kind of a hybrid mountain god, sea god thing. He's very similar to Aegir in that there's a lot of ambiguity about his character. He's a sea god, but a land god as well, and a fertility god, and he rules over a golden age. There's a lot about him that's actually like Kronos, but um, he's still considered, obviously in Greek, to be a separate titan from Kronos. But nonetheless, he deserves just as much of a war 
as Kronos did with the Titanomachy. Atlas and the Atlanteans were considered to be the last kind of refuge of the old Golden Age Titan rule, right? The Basically the Neolithic people. And I can have a whole other video about Atlantis and what my speculations are about what that myth means and the deities having to do with it. He's kind of all over the place. And for, for that reason, it's hard to give him any real sign. But to me, the A-Japan connection with being able to be a sea goat, having a little bit more dimension to it, I think it makes me want to put him in Capricorn. Now, his wife uh, make, uh, makes even more of a case for uh, a sea orientation. When I first heard her name, I thought maybe she was a goddess of rain, and usually she's portrayed as essentially a deep sea goddess of death who uses her great net to capture fishermen and, and ships and um, drag them into the sea and, and kill them. And she's kind of vilified um, along with Aegir and Lear in Ireland for um, kind of being responsible for the chaos of the sea. And it's very, it's very odd because you obviously Aegir has a lot of civilizational aspects to him, a lot more um, fortune and these sorts of things. Now maybe he could represent fortune of fishing, but he actually isn't usually explicitly fisherman deity. Ran, on the other hand, often is. Given the evidence, she definitely seems to have more Piscean, which is oceanic uh, vibes. But if I were to go with my heart on it, I would give her over to Ursa, which to me is the is the cusp which represents many rain goddesses. And this is the cusp between Cancer and Leo. Um, now Frigga. Now Frigga is said to be the daughter of Forgin, the male earth god counterpart of Yord. And we don't know who her mother was. It is certainly an interesting twist if Ymir were to be the father of Frigga. And that would imply that when Odin, Vili, and Ve go to kill Ymir and cut him into pieces, there is an aspect of him that lives on in who he kicks on to be his wife. Something that's integrated. And it's interesting that it would be Frigga because Frigga is a goddess of fate and magic. Uh, she's essentially a witch in her own way. And this makes her kind of similar to Heath, who again was martyred by the Aesir, you know, Odin included. And so there's maybe arguments to say that Heath and Frigga are the same, but they aren't considered the same in most sources. I won't really do that here. She might represent, in some ways, the death in the world, fate of the world, since Ymir represents the world, or um, Frigga could represent the fate of that world and the ultimate death of it. And Frigga maybe is a reminder of the sacrifice that is uh, and must always be made to make the world keep going. And there's aspects of Frigga that are very much in line with a character like the Celtic Morrigan, essentially a dusk goddess, a fatal dusk goddess, more meaning death. She's associated with the evening star, and the evening star is Venus, and the morning star is also Venus. Venus could be thought of as a duality at least, but usually a trinity. The morning, the midday, and the evening. Dawn goddess we will get to is Freya. Now, the dusk goddess Riga is the elder form of Freya, in a sense. Freya, uh, the morning, is the maiden form of Venus. And the crone, or elder form of Venus, is the evening star, right? When I was talking about the rebirths of Golveg, I proposed that at least two of those would be the dawn and dusk deities, uh, Freya and Frigga. And this is also what Hecate represents in the Greek and current Wicca pantheon, the maiden, the mother, and the crone. In terms of Hecate, she doesn't represent Venus usually. Usually she's more associated with the moon, and there are different, you know, cycles, uh, new moon, well, that could be metaphorically understood, but really any planet, um, any celestial, let's say, can be thought of as having a trinity, a life cycle. So out of Frigga and Freya, whichever one is the mother, I am not entirely sure. Maybe Golveg can be thought of as the mother because she was, you know, the fortune goddess of the Golden Age regime. But in terms of, of categorization, 
Corvus is the sign of Morgana, of Frigga, of course, related to Corvids. That would be crows and ravens. Are very intelligent and clever and crafty. It's almost gothic. Another quick note about Frigga actually is her Germanic name is Freya. And she has more of a relationship to ideas of freedom and love. And in fact, uh, it's hard to kind of distinguish between Freya and Freya. So it's, all, it's almost as though Odin is marrying Frigga and Freya as the same person. Perhaps Freya is thought of as young Frigga before the Aesir took over and took her as a wife. And being a wife, she grew older. And Odin being an elder by that point has an elder wife. It's another potential way of looking at it, mythologically speaking. Back for part two. I've got some coffee this time. Hope you enjoyed the intermission. Fittingly, I'm going to start part two with Odin. And I knew I needed to save it for a different session because there's a lot about him that is mysterious. This purple color is the color for the Aesir, the children of Buri and Burr, the most powerful gods in the Norse pantheon in Asgard are the Aesir. They won a war against the Vanir. It's Odin who led the Aesir to defeat the Vanir. And once they defeated the Vanir, they integrated them into Asgard, essentially. Anyway, the general narrative tends to be that the Vanir represent the substrate of Norse, and the Aesir represent the Indo-European. He himself is considered something of a wanderer, almost part magician or shaman, whilst at the same time king, king of the Aesir. And the king of Asgard goes through many trials of wisdom, like the most popular one being sacrificing his, I believe, right eye, representing the sun, to the well of Mimir. And Mimir, again, is his uncle, the magician who taught him magic. When Mimir died, Odin took his head around with him so that he could be advised by him. And so, in some ways, that was already Odin's wisdom. Now, the, the well itself is at the bottom of Yggdrasil, the world tree. And to me, this somewhat implies it comes from the underworld the reservoir. In my mind, it has something of a connection to Nott, the night goddess again, um, insofar as she's related to deities like Neith and Nephthys of Egyptian, who not only represents the night sky, but also the Chthonic abyss. And so she usually represents dreams, and in some ways, mysticism in general. It makes sense to gain insight and wisdom through this source. Mimir being associated with this wellspring of knowledge, to me, speaks almost of Charon, or Geron, uh, the old man of Greek and Indo-European myth, who's ferryman of the dead in the underworld through the river Styx. And this river Styx is like this underground reservoir I was talking about, the sacrificing is of his right eye, and it's not entirely agreed upon which eye was sacrificed. Um, some depictions show the left. There are deities like Horus and Ra, who are said to have had the right eye, the sun, left eye, the moon. Horus also lost one of his eyes in battle. It's believed to be his left eye, the moon, actually, that he lost. This is a motif that seems to go back to an ancient sky father who represents more than just the sky, also the sun and the moon and basically every celestial phenomenon. The tarot card of the hangman is also somewhat related to a myth of his where he hangs himself upside down on Yggdrasil in order to kind of see the world from a new perspective. He hung there for nine days and nine nights, again in order to gain knowledge of presumably the nine realms. Another important aspect of Odin is as in connection with the wild hunt. Him riding or leading Slipnir, his eight-legged horse, in a wild hunt through the night during Yule, presumably hunting caribou, which are a very important food item for Northern Europe throughout, even going back to the Ice Age, indicating that this myth might be very old. A lot of these myths in, in Norse and even greater Indo-European are covered in a lot more depth by a channel I follow, Craig and Ford. Feel free to check out his video on the Wild Hunt and other theories about the connections of Odin and other Norse figures. But where I'd like to go is to make a new connection. There is a particular 
interpretation that interests me. And that is one in which Odin and many of his hunting dogs are chasing souls and ghosts and spirits throughout the wilderness, either as something of a ghost hunter, I suppose, or as a ferryman of the dead, essentially shepherding them through the wilderness into the underworld or the beyond, in line with the Baltic deity Velnius, or Velinas. Velnius being Lithuanian and Velinus being Latvian. So Velnius is a wind god. His winds are associated with souls, because souls travel through the wind. He's also depicted with one eye, like Odin, and he ferries zombies, ghosts, spirits through the sky. Now, where I think he goes in the sky is a archetype across cultures. Another deity in Lithuanian, other than Velnius, would be Vakaris. He's the male counterpart of Vakarin, and both of them are deities of dusk and the west wind, and are associated with the evening star Venus. The sun sets in the west, at dusk, over the horizon. There are many deities from many pantheons, including Egyptian, where a dusk deity represents death. It is presumed they ferry the dead through the wind into the west, across the horizon. This is also part of why in Lord of the Rings the undying lands are in the far west. Going into the west means going into the afterlife. So taking that on board, we can look at Odin as a wind god leading the souls of the dead into the west. This is the greatest Indo-European influence that I see. This is Baltic religion, which is closely related to Slavic and is slightly more distantly related to Germanic. Slavic, Baltic, and Germanic cultures all likely relate back to the corded ware culture, a forest step offshoot of the Yamnaya. We don't have their language in writing. They were a nomadic people. They didn't have writing. But Indo-European linguists have reconstructed the language by looking at other words in other languages. And I think the closest reconstructed deity we have to Woden in this Proto-Indo-European might be Wihaz, Wodu, or Wothu, potentially a wind god or a wise god. I also want to make a quick note about Phineas and Finn. Phineas was a Thracian deity, and Finn is an Irish deity. They're both heroes who gain wisdom through kinds of trickery. Phineas, for stealing sacred knowledge, was punished by Zeus with blindness, and Finn gained sacred knowledge on accident from tasting a magic salmon that was meant to be eaten by his druidic mentor. And I'd like to make a final note on Horus, who, like I said, also lost an eye and was also something of a king of the gods in Egypt. But most of all, he is also associated with Venus, the morning and the evening star. Some of his older incarnations, like the native Egyptian Herakti, who is the Egyptian name for Horus. Horus is actually the name of the Ptolemaic Greek-influenced Egyptians. And a more obscure deity that resembles Horus in many ways, Nemti, who was a ferryman of souls across the sky. And he was a patron god of Hierakonopolis, who, which is the same city named after Horakti or Horus. Horus is often depicted in a boat in the sky, ferrying the dead across it into the west. It's a connection that bears multiple fruit, and I find that very interesting, and I can't resist bringing it up. To place him, I'm going again with the one most closely associated with dusk, and that is Corvus. Again, synonymous with the sign I gave to Frigga. So now I'd like to talk about his brothers, Vili and Ve. There is very little, really, that is explained about them. The two of them, along with Odin, are considered to be a primordial trinity of essentially wind gods that helped create humanity. So I have a connection here to Ask and Embla, who are the first man and woman associated with two trees, possibly Yggdrasil itself. There are some myths referring to Odin as planting Yggdrasil. Now, the two connections that are most widely accepted about the potential identity of Vili and Ve 
are Veles and Wehas. Now, I mentioned Wehas with Odin. Maybe he's related to Ve too, maybe in some ways Vili and Ve are not very different from Odin. They might have stemmed from the same wind god source. As for the Slavic deity Veles, who is most assumed to be related to Vili, Vili represents will power. And through his English name, Willow, we know that he is associated with willow trees. And this is a big giveaway because Veles, the Slavic deity, is also associated with willow trees. There's also a Proto-Indo-European reconstructed name, Welnos, or Velnos, that is a sort of chthonic shepherd god of the night who watches over cattle and sheep. Or otherwise, in other interpretations, thieves and eats cattle and sheep at night. This would be a relationship to the draconic and serpentine elements of Veles. Now, Veles is often depicted as something almost like a Dagda-like figure, an old wise man with a host of different motifs about him. He's considered chthonic, having to do with death, something like Dispotter, but he's also a trickster god and, again, a shepherd of the forest. And so he doesn't spend all of his time in the underworld. Like some chthonic underworld deities, he's associated with wealth and commerce, and yet he's something of a fairy father in the forest. A poet, a magician, a shaman. Even having characteristics that might seem similar to Odin himself. In later Slavic myth, he seems to have been depicted as a serpent, to be identified with Jormungandr, the guardian or the invader of the world tree, something of a devil, that Perun, the heroic thunder god and king of the Slavic pantheon, defeats Veles in serpent form, ascends the tree to attack the canopy where the gods live, and is pushed back down into the underworld, the lower roots of the tree. But he can also take on the shape of a bear or a wolf or trees themselves. He's a really hard deity to place. Vili and Ve, by the way, represent will and way, essentially. Ve often is associated with the priest class and religious order. If I were to place Vili and Ve at the moment, there are aspects of Vili that, if they are like Veles, are Ophiuchus here, Serpentarius, the serpent handler, and there are elements of Ve that are very much like Odin or another Corvid-like deity. The aspect of them being twins, I think, since I don't really have anywhere else to put them, might be a way to associate them with Gemini, just to give them something. All right, so now that we got through Odin, Vili, and Ve, and Frigga, let's look at the rest of the Vanir. Now, I've mentioned with Gullveig that three times they tried to burn her, almost as though she was a witch to them, and she was resurrected three times. The burning and punishment of witches is not something that only started with Christianity in Europe. The Norse, as well as the Romans, had certain stigmas against witchcraft, so that Heath would be treated as a witch, and somewhat demonized by the Norse is something that could indeed happen in pre-Christian times. Heath very much resembles Hecate. Hecate also has three forms, since Heath was reborn from Golveg three times. Hecate is also a goddess of witchcraft, prophecy, fortune, misfortune, truth, and enlightenment. And I have a cusp sign that I generally associate with witchcraft, and that is the cusp between Libra and Scorpio, which is lupus, taking place in that fitting time of late October, near Hallow's Eve. Kate and Baba Yaga and such. On to Freya, another very popular Norse deity. Now Freya is the dawn goddess of love and beauty. This is a motif that I have, of course, talked about in many mythologies, related to Ishtar, Inanna, Aphrodite, and Venus. And really it's a motif that you see around the world. Once again, the dawn is associated with the morning star, Venus. And Freya is depicted with two cats that sometimes are <laughs> leading her chariot across the sky, she being Venus, kind of like Sana, leads her chariot, the sun, across the sky, and Mani, his chariot, the moon, across the sky. Freya may relate back to an Indo-European or even older dawn goddess of Hyusos, 
Eos in Greek, Aurora in Roman, and even Ea in Sumerian. And Sumerian is not Indo-European, so it likely goes back to a very old source, possibly Middle Eastern, influencing the Indo-Europeans, leading them to have a dawn goddess. The cults of Ishtar and Aphrodite seem to have been spread by the Mediterranean Neolithic people that I often mention. This is another reason why the goddess of Norse Nana, who's considered different from Freya, I syncretize with Freya. Because Nana has a story involving her husband Baldur, where when Baldur dies, she goes to the underworld to retrieve and revive him. This is a myth that goes back to the story of Inanna in Sumerian again, whose lover Demuzid dies and Inanna descends to the underworld to retrieve him and revive him, resurrect him. Both Baldur and Demuzid are resurrected and to some degree represent the sun. He also mentioned with Dag and Dajbog and such. We can talk about that when I get to Baldur. But to me, this means that Inanna, Nana, Freya, Ea are all synonymous. And as always, we associate the dawn goddess with Libra. Now we get to her brother, Frey. Both Freya and Frey are children of Njord. And it is not often explicitly stated that Gulveig is their mother. However, since Gulveig is the wife of Njord, we can assume that she was indeed the parent of Frey and Freya. Now Frey in many ways is quite similar to Freya. He also is associated with beauty and love and light, but he has some more fertility and agricultural associations. His steed is a boar, implying that he is at home with the wilderness and that he can domesticate quite effectively, since a boar is of course near impossible to domesticate. Now, Frey is also sometimes considered a sun god, and this almost makes him resemble linguistically Ra, whose other name, Ray, essentially referring to the light of the sun. So another name for Frey by mainland Germanic peoples was Ingwas, and this seems to be the namesake of the Anglians, who so English, essentially, and they were native to a some point Scania, which is associated with the Vanir kingdom, and the Yingling dynasty. And I put on here the Yingling dynasty of Sweden is related back to Frey, to this Ingwas. It might have been an actual historical character or king. His son is Fjolnir that he had with Gertha, and I'll get to Gertha in a minute. And there are plenty of deities that we have established, Baldur, Dag, who have these light solar connotations. And because of these agricultural aspects, I actually associate him with Virgo. So his wife is Gertha. And Gertha is considered to be a daughter of Aegir and Ran, kind of outside the periphery of even the Vanir, although Aegir might be considered to be the same as Njord. This implies that Gertha is potentially a very old deity, going back to a totally separate lineage that has some distinction and yet some similarity with the Vanir. She is, of course, married with Frey of the Vanir, and so implying that she might have an agricultural Neolithic connection. Frey sends his messenger, Skirnir, who I kind of treat as a Cupid-like figure, to court Gertha so that Frey could marry her. Now, Gertha resists a good amount, and Skirnir eventually just starts threatening her, and eventually those threats work, so I'm not going to say it's the most interesting or enlightening story of all, but Ray and Gertha spent nine nights together before they wed, and it seems to have worked out ultimately, regardless of Skirnir's questionable methods. Gertha is similar to Yord, the Earth Mother. The children of Bolthorn and Elvaldi might be somehow related to a common hunter-gatherer, or Neolithic ancestor. Gertha's name essentially means earth, or girth, it means abundant and full. She rides a chariot that is pulled by two cows. And this makes her similar to Gefshun, who is the partner of Gilfi that I mentioned, being that Kronos figure, and is associated with Zealand, which is an island in Denmark, between Scania and Jutland. And Gefshun, therefore, is kind of similar to Golveg in some ways, too. So this earth mother, agriculture mother, whatever, this one in particular related to a cattle goddess, is actually similar to the Egyptian Hathor. 
So much so that Hathor, one of one of Hathor's names is actually Wartha, and also is a name for the Earth. These cattle goddesses quite often are associated with the Earth itself. And so we can't escape the association of Gertha with Horus. This, of course, being a agricultural goddess of cattle and cattle culture. And so this deity could have come from Indo-European insofar as the cattle culture of the Indo-Europeans was quite prominent, but also could have come from an earlier Neolithic source since cattle was, you know, what was spread out of Anatolia during the Neolithic. And that there is all of the Vanir that I have, at least in this section. There is another Vanir over here, Sif and Ullur by extension, that does not have a lineage that's directly related to the rest of these deities. So Sif later becomes the wife of Thor, however, she has a son, Ullur, a god of the hunt, who doesn't have a known father. The rumor is that Sif had Ullur with Odin, and aside from this being kind of a messed up situation, it also isn't directly evidenced in any real sources that I could find. So. I chose not to make that connection, I chose to treat Sif as on her own, something of a mystery. As for her motifs and where she came from culturally, that is not quite as much of a mystery to me. Sif is a fertility goddess of beauty and wheat and grains. Her golden hair is associated with wheat, and she is considered to be the queen of the elves in Asgard, and the elves again descended from Alvaldi up here might indicate that she could be a lineage of this old kind like Edun, but we can't be entirely sure. Certainly, since she is an agricultural deity, she can be assumed to have some origin in Neolithic settlers. It is also worth noting very quickly that the blonde hair gene originated in at least two separate locations, one being somewhere in or around Scandinavia, and this I believe would be somewhere around 20,000 years ago. So it would have been hunter-gatherers that had this blonde hair, and even the Yamnaya are now known and understood to have not been blonde hair Aryans, as was put forth by questionable sources, but actually had darker hair when an offshoot of the Yamnaya branched into the corded wear culture into Germany and the Baltic states, they mixed with local people who were already mixed with Neolithic people who were also darker skin and darker hair to get blonde hair features. So this aspect of Sif being blonde doesn't necessarily mean Neolithic people from the Mediterranean, from Anatolia, who did not have blonde hair, were not potentially her origin. Now, about her hair, there's of course the famous myth that Loki cut her hair and Thor forced Loki to craft her some golden headwear to replace it. And there is another myth in Greek sources of the constellation of Coma Berenices, who's the golden hair of Berenice or Bereniki. And Berenice or Pharoniki is actually the same as Nike, the Greek goddess of victory. And victory goddesses I usually associate like with Vacarini and Vicaris that I mentioned with Dusk and with Corvus, but another connection of Coma Berenices with Sif is in the constellation of Virgo, where one of the older depictions of Virgo has her holding the Libra, the scales in one hand, and in the other hand Coma Berenices, which is not at that point hair, but wheat, and so we have a direct connection here of blonde hair and wheat, being an aspect of the agricultural Virgo deity, Demeter, or she is called Astria by the Greeks. Now, Pharoniki or Nike is not often associated with agriculture. However, if, if we expand through comparative mythology our research for Nike's origins, we find that the victory goddess has precedence throughout mythology. Nekhebit of Egyptian who's also a goddess of victory and dusk. Nicaragua of Luwians. Hittites have Kibi, another goddess of victory. The Hurrians have Kipa. The Akkadians even have Nikal, and the Sumerians Ningal. So this motif goes back very far, but looking at the Hittite version in particular, Kibi, she is conflated or considered an alternative version 
of an Anatolian mother goddess, Kabele. And Kabele is the seated agricultural deity that represents essentially the motherland. She is seated in a place of power as a queen of civilization. And when the civilization, the culture, the, the nation, the empire, the state, whatever it is, is at war, she takes on the persona of a goddess of victory and war in defense of the motherland. This, I think, is the, the, the interesting connection between a victory goddess and the agricultural deity, and might be the connection we might have between a deity like Sif and one like Baroness and Nike. Like Frey, I play Sif in Virgo. Now her son, Ullr, again a bastard of unknown origin, is the god of the hunt. And there are a few deities that might be considered god of the hunt in Norse. Odin himself is a god of the wild hunt. There's Vidar that is essentially a hunting deity in the wilderness. There's Hodair that's an archer, presumably a hunter as well. But Ullr is in particular considered to be the hunting deity. Now he's also associated with winter and snow and skiing, making him something of a counterpart to what we've already covered with uh, Skadi up here. Further reinforcing the possibility that perhaps Sif might be part of this general elvish family. But overall, his name and his duties somewhat relate him possibly to Orion, also a hunter and a wild man. Hunting gods in general I associate with the cusp of Cancer and Leo, which is Ursa, the bear constellation. A lot of these hunting deities, they transform into a bear or otherwise are represented by a bear. And so it fits. And that would be all of the Vanir now that I have in my chart. And now at last, I would like to explore the lineage of Loki. Many people's favorite, certainly one of my favorites in Norse, especially when you consider the motifs that he truly relates back to. But first we'll start with his wife, Sigyn, or Sigyn. Sometimes it's with the most obscure and less attested deities that I make my most radical syncretisms. But it's also in some of the more obscure deities that only have a few little stories that taking a few of those deities and syncretizing them together, you get a multifaceted character that now has a lot more meaning and depth. Now, Sigyn is only referenced as the wife of Loki, in particular during his imprisonment in the underworld. Loki is finally punished and tied to the bottom roots of Yggdrasil, where Jormungandr hangs over him and drops venom onto him. Sigyn is shown as a faithful and devoted wife who gathers the venom of Jormungandr before it can drop onto Loki and torture him. She's something of a forgiving and benevolent and caring figure. But something I find very interesting about this thonic imagery is that she resembles an oracle like that of Delphi, the Pythia, who is so named as essentially a servant of the Chthonic serpent Delphini, which is a female serpent, or Python, the male version, that is defeated by Apollo. Whether Delphini or Python, the sun god Apollo in Greek mythology is said to have banished them to the underworld. And in the underworld, in this particular mountain, at the site of Delphi, there is set up an oracle where these priestesses inhale the noxious fumes, which are psychedelic, of the mountain, presumed to come from this serpent, which is essentially whispering wisdom into their ears. Across the world, serpents are associated with wisdom. In Mayan and Aztec myth, there's Ihikatl for the Aztecs, and Kukul Khan of the Mayan, who goes into the belly and the mouth of the serpent Quetzalcoatl, and gains great wisdom insight. Although there's not much more indicating Sigyn's role as something of an oracle, this chthonic imagery of her collecting the venom, potentially using this venom in some way, to me speaks of that deeper interpretation. Now Sigyn is also considered to be, by Loki, the mother of Vali, 
who is either the son of Loki or the son of Odin. And I prefer to conflate them and have it be ambiguous. He's one of those. And in both versions of his character, he represents retribution, essentially either for Loki or for Odin. And the other son of Sigyn and Loki is Narfi. And that's where things get very interesting because Narfi is way back here. He is the father of Nott. And as we've established, Nott is the oldest deity in almost any pantheon in the world, right there next to time itself, Mundufari. And for Loki and Sigyn to be the grandparents of Nott is a significant note. It doesn't really make any sense in the lineage of everything, honestly, because almost every deity is descended from Nott. So there's certainly something deeper going on. In my chart, I have conflated her with Helen. Now, Sigyn is not given an explicit parentage, and this is another reason why conflation can be useful, because Helen is the daughter of Aegir and Ran. She would be a sister of Gertha, and Helen is a goddess of protection and comfort and compassion and mercy and divination as well. All of these point to a character similar to Sigyn, who is protective and compassionate in the case of Loki saving him from the venom of Jormungandr. But also with connotations of divination, these Pythian ideas of being a goddess of much depth and wisdom. There's also aspects of her that almost resemble Hela. If Hela had a good version, had a kind and caring and compassionate version, Hela is often depicted as part alive and part dead. Perhaps her living part is Hylin. Of course, Hela is a child of Loki and Gaboda, and we'll get to her, but a few other goddesses of wisdom and divination in Norse mythology. There are actually quite a few, and although I don't have enough space up here <laughs> to really list all of the possible conflations, another one I will mention is Saga. And Saga I like to think of as, like, uh, in relation to a saga of written work of great value and wisdom. And she is likewise a prophet and an oracle of divination and wisdom. And in the particular story, shared an entire day of drinking and storytelling with Odin, depicted pouring him drinks with her pitcher. This night she seems to have been impregnated with Tyr, another son of Odin. And as you can see, I drew a special line for that possibility. So although I don't have Saga stated in here, I still have a line. So Sigyn, Saga, there's a similarity there. And Shofin is another Norse goddess, this time of love and friendship and marriage. And she's often associated with dolls. And I prefer to think her as similar to Sophia, the Gnostic Greek goddess of wisdom, a very important goddess in the Gnostic tradition, basically the goddess, thus in line with the aspects of Pythia and Saga, this goddess of divination and wisdom that guides through psychedelics, through philosophy, through story. This is a motif of the female storyteller, the masculine version of a philosopher is analytical and somewhat atheistic and technical, whereas the feminine philosopher tends to be a storyteller, speaking in metaphor and through psychedelics and through divination, through all these different methods. And there is a word for this tradition of female philosophers in Norse culture, and that is a vor or a bar. And sometimes it's depicted as a goddess, a kind of Valkyrie, of poetry and thought and truth and awareness, depicted with a spear representing the projection of intention and thought and criticality. Vor seems to be the traveling and wandering goddess of wisdom that inspires the vulvas, who are shamanic prophetic women who are allowed to forego motherhood and the regular norms of Norse culture to wander as shamanesses. They're also associated with mushrooms, potentially the psychedelic kind. And I hear vulva and, and I'm reminded of a Lithuanian deity, Vevora, who is a goddess of Mercury. And this would be quite fitting, since Mercury, just like Mercurius, just like Hermes, represents a wandering kind of wisdom. In many deities, in this case female as well as male, 
they are considered to be wanderers and travelers. Where would we place her? Sometimes we could associate with Ophiuchus being associated with the, the serpent and its wisdom. But which planet, which zodiac sign is associated most with Mercury and wisdom and travel in the sense that we're talking about? I'd say Gemini. And now we get to Loki. Now Loki is another complex figure, very complex indeed. It is widely suspected that an older version of Loki, sometimes referred to as uh, older or elder Loki, is Lothar. And Lothar is a kind of chaotic primordial creator god, much like Villian Ve that we discussed, who was indeed involved with the creation of humanity as well as all life. Although Vili, Ve, and Odin are said to have essentially planted and created Ask and Embla, it is Lothar who is said to have given them life. And Lothar, like Lothi, is a shapeshifter. And this essentially resembles evolution and mutation, DNA, the adaptability, the changeability of life to suit many forms. This is a motif around the world. I will mention two in particular. The first is a Samshian deity, Penutian people in the Cascades region, uh, the west coast of the United States. They have an important deity named Chione, who's a trickster god and potentially a moon god related to the eclipse, who's a shapeshifter, a transformer, a magician. He's kind of like Mai, the trickster coyote of many Amerindian myths, and he probably relates to another, this time Sally Shan, also Cascadian region deity of transformation and change. She transforms into many animals, representing, again, the changeability of life and creation in general. He actually transformed himself into all of the animals that exist in order to create them. So this is also similar to the mythology of ayahuasca by Amazonian tribes. There's a particular group of deities referred to as the Avirari, the hundred eye serpentine spirits that are seen throughout transcultural psychedelic experiences. These spirits are said to have taken the form of many animals and living things on earth to hide from some other entities that are hunting them. This, I think, is or one origin of Lothar and Loki, and this might also be associated in general with the Rainbow Serpent, which in Norse is closest to the Jormungandr, but of course Jormungandr is a child of Loki in a similar way to how Fenrir might represent Mai or the Coyote as a roaming trickster. The other deity I'd like to uh, tie it to is one that we already mentioned, Veles, the more humanoid serpentine deity of the Slavs, later demonized as a serpent or a dragon, actually resembles Lothar to some degree as well, and for that reason we might almost think of Vili as being identical, a god of will and an instigator of the creation of life. There are aspects of this chthonic serpent that might resemble something like Absu of Babylonian myth, a primordial deity that is actually made king of the gods and certain pantheons like the Elamites. And Abzu is, of course, ultimately replaced by Enki. And Enki is something of a trickster god for Sumerians. But another connection I have to mention to the original linguistics behind Loki. There is a version of Loki that is essentially a counterpart directly of Thor. Thor representing thunder, Loki representing lightning. And this goes back to the parentage of Loki in Laufey and Ferbauti. As the story goes, Loki was born when Ferbauti struck Laufey with lightning. Ferbauti, a sort of storm god, and Laufey, a sort of tree goddess, the tree burst into flame, and this flame from lightning became Loki. Some of the older linguistics surrounding Loki might be thought of as the same as Halogi or Logi. I think I mentioned that he would be a brother of Besla and Mimir and Njord and Aegir. Halogi is a god of fire. He's kind of like Agni of the Vedic pantheon. 
in particular, it represents wildfires. Another name for Mangala, the red one, who is basically Agni again, Lohita. This, of course, related to heat. Even the Egyptians have a heat god called Hot. So hot, heat, they all have a very old linguistics that goes even beyond into European, in my opinion. Insofar as Loki is the fire god, like Agni, Lahogi, then I put him in Ares. Insofar as he is the transformative Lothar serpentine figure, he is Ophiuchus. Sorry, put those here. Talking about their parentage, Again, there is not much information on it. All we know is the myth, and we can deduce a lot out of the, the myth of how Loki was, was born. We have the influence of a storm god on a tree goddess, essentially. Laufi means leafy, therefore in my mind is something of a, a dryad, like a tree nymph or fairy. And this could be a older, sort of deity almost like Edun and for a fertility tree goddess I typically have Virgo the fertility goddess fundamentally a kind of elder form of agriculture in gathering we might also potentially think of Laufey as Yggdrasil as the tree itself in which case there might be some relationship between Laufey and Ask and Embla I'm not sure so I left two of them as Jotun this uh, blue color is a Jotun color. The ice giants or fire giants are just giants in general. Verbauti is certainly a Jotun, and what we do know is he must have some power over lightning, because that's what he used. In my research, I think it is Perkunos, and Perkunos is the Proto-Indo-European reconstruction of a thunderstorm god related to oaks and rain. He's similar to Thor because he does have a hammer that he uses to strike thunderstones off of the mountain sky. Um, this relates in part to Finnish tradition which sees the sky as a great mountain and part of that I'll talk about when we get to Thor. But Perkwunos is essentially the thundery sky father of the Indo-Europeans. He's Perkunos to the Prussians, Perkunas to the Lithuanians, Perkili to the Finnish, Perun to the Slavic, Perendi to the Albanians, who are Illyrian descended, Arjanya to the Vedic tradition, he even relates to Zeus and Jupiter of Greek and Roman. There is an obscure Gothic deity named Perguinus. Northern Germanic would be Norse. Eastern Germanic is where the Goths came from, so like the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths. They were Germans who actually lived in near the steppe. Nonetheless, we have Ferguinus, who is their storm god. Something almost Slavic, something almost uh, Baltic, something of a direct Indo-European influence with Ferbauti. And it's interesting to see Ferbauti as distinct from Thor, despite so many similarities between their characters. But nonetheless, as storm gods often are, I place them with Jupiter in Sagittarius. So interesting that the, the rival of Thor in Loki would be a son of essentially a version of Thor. So now let's talk about the other wife or partner of Loki. And that is Angerboda. It's through Angerboda and Loki, not Sigyn where Hela, Fenrir, and Jormungandr, the great monsters, are born. And there is, again, a very ancient motif shared with many cultures of a mother of monsters. Often, it's a serpentine goddess who is a mother of many great giants or monsters that are constantly fighting or being fought by the heroes of that pantheon, a figure that is demonized. In Sumerian mythology, it's Tiamat, and she has more of an oceanic connotation, but nonetheless is considered a dragon. Enlil fights her early on, and later when the Babylonians come in, they bring Marduk, the thunder god of theirs, with them, and he, in the myth, defeats Tiamat and uses her to uh, 
built the world essentially well kind of like ymir actually but tiamat is essentially the mother of all the gods in some way she's like gaia because gaia also has many monsters and the gigantes and stuff that she sends to try to take out the gods from time to time the titans themselves are uh, children of Gaia. But Tiamat's partner is who else but Absu. And we talked about how Lothar and Loki are somewhat similar to Absu and to Anger, to Enki. And of course Enki comes by later to become king of the underworld after Absu is removed from power. But nonetheless he takes on kind of the attributes of Absu as the god of the underworld reservoir of fertility, of the springs of where all rivers come from. In Babylonian and Sumerian myth, Tiamat is the goddess of salt water of the oceans, and Absu is the god of fresh water in the underworld, as if Angerboda is this monster queen. Perhaps she is banished. There's another Greek goddess of many monsters called Echidna, who is also a serpent mother. And it's actually in Scythian myth that we get that. And Scythians are very direct descendants of the Yamnaya steppe people. They lived where the Yamnaya lived eventually. So this is certainly where I would say I could finally throw Ophiuchus into the mix. Both Loki and Angerboda to me are Ophiuchus. So since we keep talking about the world serpent, I'd like to just quickly talk about Jormungandr. Now, of course, there are cosmic serpents in pantheons across the world. Serpent gods and goddesses appear to be some of the oldest deities. Cosmic serpent, rainbow serpent, usually they are associated with wisdom. Often they're associated with chaos. Often they are defeated or regularly attacked, like in the case of Egyptian with a pepi every night, Ra and Set. They work together to defeat the serpent. Of course, we have popular deities like Quetzalcoatl and Nahas, the name of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. And we have Knobis, who's the demiurge in Gnostic mythology. But we have an aboriginal rainbow serpent whose name is Jurlunger or Jurlungul. And this is absurdly similar to Jormungandr. I'm not sure how to explain this, but I mean, regardless of any linguistic commonality that could possibly be the motif is certainly common to all of humanity because not only are serpents always important but a lot of the story beats involved with them are quite similar and we talked about lothar and veles these others that might be conflated with the cosmic serpent as well so of course it's going to be ophiuchus next fenrir now fenrir is not explicitly stated to be a trickster god but he's certainly a god of chaos, because he brings chaos when he is wild on the world, when he is roaming the world. This is why Tyr is tasked with binding him and bringing them to the underworld. And there is another wolf guard dog type deity in Norse called Garmir. And the way I prefer to think about it, Fenrir is the trickster chaotic deity form that is traveling the world creating chaos similar to Maya and Coyote and Tyr ultimately wrestles him and binds him and brings him down to the underworld where he becomes Garmir and can be considered similar to Cerberus in Greek. These wolves and dogs that guard the underworld that is actually common in many mythologies. I mean you even have an Aztec deity Torotl who is the underworld god of death and is depicted as a kind of dog this similar to the egyptian anubis who is also a canine deity of the underworld so that's actually how i prefer to think of fenrir essentially the dynamic between tyr and fenrir is tyr is a shepherd and fenrir is the wolf and of course the shepherd is protecting their sheep their flock from the wolf ultimately the binding of fenrir to the underworld is the innovation of shepherdry and ultimately agriculture against the wild wolf. And in another sense, the wild wolf is domesticated into Garmir and becomes a guard dog rather than a force of chaos on the world. And so this motif I put in Lupus, and Lupus is of course the constellation of the werewolf. And the werewolf in many ways is a transformer, a trickster, 
and a lone wolf. Because there are wolves that work in packs, this is different. And the last of this chthonic pantheon, we have Hela. Now Hela, as I said, is part alive and part decaying. She is the namesake of the Christian Hell, since of course she inhabits and rules the underworld and watches over the dead. But a few other um, deities from other pantheons that actually relate more to her than others would be Melano of Greek, who is a goddess of ghosts and nightmares and fear and insanity. She's also depicted dualistic with part undead and part alive. The both of them, Hela and Melano, also are quite similar to an Etruscan deity, Mania, which, fitting for the name, Mania is considered, uh, you know, being mad, being crazy, being insane. Uh, that is what she represents, and she represents also ghosts and death and the souls in the afterlife. In general, a goddess of death and the underworld, we should always look at the Sumerian and Semitic sources in Urkala and Kurgal. A Chthonic goddess of the underworld, death, darkness, and the reincarnation of souls. There's related deities in Anatolian, Luwian, Hittite, like Elani, Elanzu, and Lelwani that actually resembles Persephone to some degree. There's a form that represents a youthful fertility goddess, and then a form that represents a Chthonic goddess of death, and the two might have transformed into one another um, from time to time. And this dualistic nature, again, I prefer to give her Scorpio as the quintessential sign of the underworld. While we're Almost near the topic, I want to quickly talk about Ask and Embla, the first man and the first woman. Ask is represented by an ash tree, and Embla represents a elm tree. And of course, as I said, Lothar turned these two trees, made by Vili Vey and Odin, into humans. And this creates an interesting dynamic, kind of resembling the Garden of Eden, where Nahas, the serpent in the tree, watched over and tempted Eve to greater wisdom and knowledge. We have already established the goddess Edun of the garden related to Eden, which has Eve connotations as a cultivator of the fruits of immortality. And we've also established a Pythian motif of a goddess which listens to the whispers of the serpent. I mentioned Persephone and the relationship of Persephone to Eve as a goddess in Roman called Proserpina that essentially listens to the serpent, like Serapis, Hades, offers her a life in the Chthonic realm and potentially greater wisdom and a greater purpose. There is a lot going into this and it certainly goes back to a very old myth that's much older than uh, Judeo-Christian influence, in, in my opinion. The closest linguistics I can find for Ask and the Ash tree in relation to Adam would be Ash or Ashur, who is an Egyptian, Berber, and Semitic deity. Ash is an Egyptian god of oases, and an oasis is essentially a paradise. It's its own little Garden of Eden. It is thought to have been a primary deity for the Berber peoples who lived in the Siwa oasis for instance, before the Egyptians conquered it. And the Berbers refer to this great sky god as Ashaman. So when I see the first man, the first woman in many mythologies, and they are in many mythologies, even throughout Africa as well, I see it as between, as we can see, Eden here, Nutculus, the rabbit, as the first woman. Again, the rabbit is associated with fertility and with reproduction. And with Ask, first man, often associated even with the sky god and the sky father, the patriarch of all of humanity would be Aquarius. So now at last we can return and finish strong with all of the remaining Aesir gods. Finally, I get to Thor, the most popular Norse deity. Now Thor, as I established with Perkunos, relates back to a in Indo-European storm god. Thor does not appear to be a sky father in the Norse pantheon, although he is a father of a few deities. Nonetheless, he is mostly seen as a heroic son of Odin, Odin being more the all-father. 
And this is interesting because Zeus is obviously considered the king of the Greek pantheon, Jupiter, the king of the Roman pantheon, Tarhana, king of the Hittites, Marduk, the king of the Babylonians. The thunder god is almost always the king in the respective pantheon. Even going into uh, Aztec and Mayan, we got Chak and Tlaloc, and Indra is very important in Hinduism. But one way or another, the commonality between all of these deities is that they have heroic feats. Even Zeus has many heroic feats in the Titanomachy against Kronos and the Titans. He has a heroic feat against Typhon, the weather god of chaos. Even Hercules, to some extent, takes after this thunder god heroic motif. I mean, he also defeats the Hydra. Tarhana helps defeat Apsi and these other chaotic forces of the world. Thor is always hunting for Jormungandr and is prophesied to fight him in Ragnarok. And Thor, of course, fights many of the Jotun and, and other forces of chaos in the world to kind of protect the, the people. And it would seem that Thor has also influenced some other mythologies, like the Sami of northern Scandinavia, who are related to the Finns. They have the thunder god called Thoragallus. They also have another thunder god called Tyrmis. Um, people have done plenty of videos talking about his escapades, but I feel like I got the gist of it. He is a heroic storm god, and this is like a quintessential motif of Sagittarius. I think I can leave it at there. We mentioned Sif, so we might as well mention the children of Thor. Surprisingly, he doesn't actually have too many, and the ones he does have are not that popular, because their motifs are not too unique from one another, or too particularly prominent or important in uh, a mythology. They're essentially just more heroic dudes and dudettes. Thrude is his daughter with Sif, and she's essentially a big, big strong warrior, just like the other two sons he has, Modi and Magni. Modi is a god of wrath, and Magni is a god of strength, almost like Kratos. The two brothers, Modi and Magni, seemingly twins, both survive Ragnarok. As for their zodiacal associations, I don't really have enough to work with. For the sake of variety, let's just say they all have fairly Ares motif, especially in terms of wrath and strength. They're almost like war gods. Some similar deities, although this category is many different deities, many different names, and most of them without much detail. But the Valkyries are children of Riga and Odin. And some of them might actually be of different partners with Odin, but in general the Valkyries are an extended aspect of Riga and Odin. Why is that? Because we talked about the Baltic dusk goddess Vakarin. Vakarin evolves in Norse into the Valkyries and is related, like I said, to Nike and Victoria, these goddesses of victory. The key to the idea of victory and its relationship to dusk is, again, the dusk is the horizon in which your soul goes through the sky into the underworld. The Valkyries are specifically tasked with taking dead honored warriors and bringing them across the sky over the horizon at dusk into Valhalla. And Valhalla is a hall specifically set up and ruled by Odin. Odin again being a dusk god bringing souls over the horizon. Some of these souls collected by his daughters the Valkyries are brought to Valhalla where they are celebrated as, as great warriors. Although there are many personas of the Valkyries in general the idea of a Valkyrie is in line with the Victory Goddess, which is an aspect, again, of Orbis. And there's, there's another aspect that I could bring up very quickly. In Greek myth, there are these demonic spirits that are kind of half bird and half human called harpies. And harpies are vulture-like winged women who collect the dead and ferry them to the underworld. And far from the Valkyries, this is not necessarily considered too much of a good thing. A vulture, in that sense, is very related to the motif of 
Victoria and the Valkyries. I mentioned Nekbet, a Egyptian vulture-headed goddess, who's also a goddess of dusk. Next we have Bragi, another son of Odin and Frigga, although sometimes he is said to be a son of Odin and someone else. Nonetheless, he is a muse, a uh, musician god, a bard, a poet, like Orpheus, a legendary poet and bard in Greek Orphic tradition, and also like Ogma, a Celtic deity of speech and poetry and wisdom. I tend to put the bard deities in the cusp between Gemini and Cancer, generally representing wilderness as well as music which in, in a way is wild. It's a acceptance of the form and order of the world, the harmony of the world. Next we get to Tyr, which I mentioned a few times. He is the war god. He's got another name in Germanic as Tiwaz. And there's certain linguists that try to relate him either to Thor, as a kind of war version of Thor, and others to uh, Deus, the same root as Zeus, this sky father sort of motif. I don't see that as much. Tyr has no real aspects of being a sky father, all father kind of relationship. I suppose the closest you can get to it is who I think he might relate to is Tutatis. And Tutatis is a Belgic, you know, kind of a blend of Germanic and Celtic deity, also considered to be one of the patron gods of the English people, or the Anglican people of, of Jutland. The day Tuesday is named after Tyr. Tutatis is a tutelary deity. Tutelary means, like, essentially titular. It's like the patron protector and representative, the metaphor for a particular locality or tribe or people or city. Tyr, in that case, represents any tribe, any city of the Germanic and Norse people has times of war and of protection. Now, another aspect of his protective nature is, as I believe, a shepherd. This is due to an association I've found throughout various mythologies of the sign of Ares and its relationship to not only gods of war, but also shepherd gods. Shepherd gods like Amun and Martu of Semitic mythologies, and Felvara of Kartvelian mythology in, in Georgia. They protect their sheep, flocks, and by extension their city, their civilization, their people from wolves, from raiders, from threats on the outside. Tyr sacrifices his hand to Fenrir in order to hold him in place and bind him and bring him to the underworld to save the overworld from his chaos, from his, his constant threat to the other gods and to mankind. Tyr thus represents a motif of sacrifice. Tyr might also relate to the idea of berserkers, um, in particular the form of Ulf Hednar, which is a form of berserker. Berserker means bear, and so they would more be related to wearing the hide of a bear and embodying the frenzied, violent nature of a bear, Ulfednar would do the same thing, only with wolves and wolf hides. Of course, Tyr being the enemy of Fenrir. Of all times, this is when I would like to mention that we at Studio Pandemonia make stuff and are trying to make more things to do with mythology. And these are our little Berserker Tear to Tatis candles. Mm. Different scents and colors. You can find these and more mythological things like these in our Studio Pandemonia shop on Etsy. If you buy one of these, you'll really help us out. Um, you can directly support us. And with that, let's, let's move on to Heimdall. So Heimdall is said to have nine mothers that raised him with Odin. But when we look at another deity, Aegir, we find that Aegir had nine daughters. He had nine daughters, each representing waves. 
And I think this is possibly the nine mothers of Heimdall. If Heimdall is something of a grandson of Aegir, as a god of vision and vigilance, is quite interesting. He is the herald of the gods, of course, um, guarding the Rainbow Bridge, the Bifrost. When I noticed the nine mothers and the nine daughters, that perhaps this was an indication that Aegir could be related to Atlas. And Atlas had seven daughters, the Pleiades, the Atlantides. And it would make sense if the Atlantides were synonymous with these, these wave goddesses, these sea nymphs. One of these Pleiades sea nymphs is Maya, and Maya is the mother of Hermes in Greek mythology. Hermes is also a herald of the Greek gods, and like Heimdall, is sometimes associated with rainbows. And in general, this bridge between the heavens and the earth, or between Asgard and the other realms, might relate to a hermetic kind of messenger god, a bridge between the heavens and the earth. There's an Estonian deity called Hoija that is a spirit of protection and guardianship, which perhaps has some relationship to Heimdall. Heimdall is also similar to a Meslem, who's a Babylonian door god who takes the form of a tree. Emeslem is associated with Gemini because he has a twin, Era, who he guards the door of the underworld with. This also relates in part to Janus, the Roman, and Colsans, the Etruscan, two-faced guardian door god. All of these Geminian motifs relate back to the divine twins, which we find everywhere. Castor and Pollux, Coius and Creus, Emeslem and Era. There's certainly something going on here, and whatever it is, it's fairly Geminian. Speaking of Mercury, let's look at Hermodir. Now, Hermodir is, to me, possibly inherited from Roman sources or a syncretic relationship between Germanic and Roman culture. This, of course, occurring when the Romans pushed into Germanic territories and into Gaul. I didn't mention this with Odin, but the Romans, when they conquered the Gauls and the Germans, saw figures like Odin because he was this wandering wizard with a staff or a spear who represented wisdom, and who ferried the souls of the dead into the underworld, just like Mercury, just like Hermes does, by the way. They thought that he was Hermes. This deity, Hermodir, who is a messenger god, might have been a synthesis of Odin and Hermes that was later integrated into the Norse system as a son of Odin. Oh, here comes the cat. It's again like... Heimdall. I'm going with Gemini here. So I've mentioned Hodor a few times, yet another son of Odin, this time Odin and Frigga again. Hodor is famed for being tricked by Loki with either blindfolds or being blind with shooting Baldur, his brother, tragically killing Baldur, leading Nana Baldur's wife to try to revive him in the underworld and leaving Hodor to be exiled from Asgard and hunted by Odin's son, Vali. Of course, being a comparative mythologist, I look at mythologies from around the world, and there is a precedence for, for a divine archer deity shooting a sun god. In a Chinese and Japanese myth of the Ten Sons, the solar goddess gives birth to ten blackbirds, and each one represents a sun. And as they all rise at the same time in the morning, they cause great drought. Too many suns, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. So the white emperor at that time, Di Jun, gives the divine archer, Hao Yi, a divine bow that he then uses to shoot down nine of the ten crows or blackbirds, thus allowing only one sun 
to rise. Hao Yi and Japanese Uri and Norse Hoder sound very similar, and the myths are actually a little bit similar. And another myth that's similar to that is the story of Rama and Ravana. Ravana is a god with ten heads who attempts to essentially take over the entire pantheon. In a sense, he's trying to become the sun, the highest god. And Rama, the great archer tasked by Vishnu and to retrieve his wife from Ravana, who stole her, kill Ravana. And Ravana resembles something of a raven, a blackbird, a crow again, a corvid. If you've ever noticed, they are quite obsessed with shiny and precious objects. They like to take things, they like to steal things. Since we have Odin here, who's again like Horus, and is himself associated with ravens, saying it's as though Odin in the Norse pantheon was the last blackbird. But that's enough speculation on that point. When it comes to the motif of the divine hunter, I don't distinguish this very much from something like Ullr, the, the hunting god, Ursa, again, the cusp of Cancer and Leo. It would be interesting to try to twist the myth to make these two characters related in some way. But now we get to Hodur's brother, whom he martyrs, Baldur. And Baldur is actually very similar to Dog, and it's part of the reason I believe that they might both be the same original motif, but entering Norse mythology uh, two separate times with two different cultural influences. It is possible, by the way, for a culture with a particular deity to invade somewhere and spread that deity's motif into that culture, and for another culture related to that culture with a similar deity that split off to invade as well and to spread that same exact deity twice. <laughs> Dog, I believe, because of his similarity to Dajbog, because of him being horseback, which is a much later Iranian influence, I think is more heavily Indo-European. Whereas Baldur, I believe, especially because of the myth between him and Nana, Nana resembling Inanna, him in that case resembling Demuzid and Tammuz and old shepherd gods, and maybe like Adonis of Greek as well, might be actually an older Neolithic influence version of this sun god. Like I've said before, he also resembles Frey a little bit with the light aspects and uh, Lug, again an Irish deity of light. But possibly the most clear evidence that Baldur and Dog are the same is in the English or Anglian sun god, Baldeg. And he is, quite simply, the same thing. An interesting note about Lug, who is considered a god of light, is that he usurps the Fomorian sun god in Ireland, Balor. And Balor is essentially the influence behind the Eye of Sauron. Balor is portrayed as a giant cyclops, this great burning eye representing the sun that is too hot and leads to drought. So we have another one of these famine motifs similar to the Blackbird, where there's too many, too many suns. In this case, there's too much sun. And Balor, of course, relating potentially to this older Balder. And the difference between the Tuatha de Nan in Ireland and the Fomorians in Ireland is that the Fomorians lived there before the Tuatha Dé Náin. The Tuatha Dé Náin are very clearly Indo-European Celtic people, whereas the Fomorians were a pre-Celtic people living in Ireland. Who would that be? Probably the same exact dynamic as we see here. We got Dog, step influence, and then we have Baldur of an earlier Neolithic influence. Baldur was demonized by later Indo-Europeans, whose version of the light dog god was either Dagda or Lug, youthful god of light and liberation and enlightenment. So it's interesting to see Baldur as being considered a Aesir insofar as he's the son of Odin and Frigga, because if Odin and Frigga are really understood to be possibly Indo-European influences, then Baldur, you would think, is older than either of them. And that's when you might consider that Frey, which has more agricultural and grounded aspects might have been a more original Neolithic form of Baldur, and that the dynamic between Freya and Frey as counterparts, in this case brother and sister, might have originally been something of counterparts between the dawn goddess and the sun god, Ishtar-like deity and the Adonis or Demuzid-like deity. Nonetheless, Baldur being complex, 
And being similar to dog, I put in Leo. Or if we were to entertain a mix between Frey and Balder, it might actually resemble the Egyptian sun and fertility god Osiris. And he has a similar story. He uh, he goes into the underworld and is ultimately resurrected. His son being Horus. In which case, there's a reversal of uh, Balder and Odin, where. In Egyptian sources, Balder would be older than Odin. He'd be the father of Odin. And Odin would be trying to avenge the death of Balder by defeating Set. In which case, Hodor could be considered Set. And Vali, the next deity I want to talk about, was conceived by Odin with, with a random Jotun goddess, Grid, to avenge the death of Balder on Hodor. Vali, in that sense, is actually quite similar to Horus. Coincidentally, there's also a Hindu deity named Vali, who is also tasked with wrath and retribution, this time against Rama. And as I've established, Rama's closest character would be Hodor, in which case there's a very interesting thing going on here. If Vali in Hindu sources, and the two versions of Holly, one son of Loki and one son of Odin, are taken to all be the same then all these stories might come back around again. In the Hindu sources, Rama actually kills Vali, and we might entertain that ultimately Hodor kills Vali, and Vali is not able to exact his revenge. However, we do not know, according to the Norse sources, what happens to Vali ultimately, since he is said to have survived Ragnarok. And this is where I get to another deity that might as well be treated as the same as Valley in Norse pantheon, and that is Vidar. Now, Vidar is a Norse war god and wild god. He represents the woodlands. He's something, again, like Ullr, of a wild hunter who roams the wilderness. Uh, during Ragnarok, he is prophesied to avenge Odin against Fenrir, since Fenrir devours Odin in Ragnarok. And Vidar is the one who kills Fenrir and survives Ragnarok. Vali and Vidar both survive Ragnarok, and both are tasked with avenging, in one case Baldur, the other case Odin. Of course, Vali is a son of Odin, and if Odin were to be killed, Vali would likely avenge Odin too. And since Hodor is himself something of a hunting deity, wandering the wilds, you would suspect that Vali for most of his time, would not be in Asgard, but would be out in the wilds searching tirelessly for Hodor. And that's how I tend to think of it. I think of Vali and Vidar as the same. Now, another aspect of Vidar that is very interesting and might connect to other deities is his name, which is, by some linguists, related potentially to a Brythonic fertility god and, and wild god, Viridios whose name means like green and vigorous and youthful, and he's depicted nude and often green, covered with green things. He's like the green man, a hunter god in English folklore, almost like Pan. To me, a very interesting character, and I think Vidar might as well be that character. Now, as for where do I place this combo of Valley and Vidar, it's Difficult not to see in the vengeance and the wrath, especially with Vali and his very idea of, of valor as being Ares compatible. But at the same time, as a hunter and a wilderman, he has many of the same aspects as we get with Ursa in the hunter gods, <laughs> Hodor and Ullr. Of course, um, how would I explain the character of? Valley and Vidar being the same as Hodor, if they are born to avenge themselves against Hodor. And I would say there's a possibility to spin the story in such a way that he's at war with himself, or that he has to prove himself. He's banished, like Vidar and Valley, to roam the wilds. For what purpose? Vengeance or perhaps redemption? And at the very last, we come to a very interesting and I think underappreciated deity. Orseti likely relates linguistically to Poseidon. Whether or not he was a Roman-influenced Germanic deity like Hermodir is, I am not entirely sure since the name is so similar to Poseidon, and he is also a sea god. 
in the same way that Poseidon is. But Forseti is actually, in some ways, more interesting than Poseidon. Because Poseidon is often just a sort of sea god who's minding his own business and is a bit of a chaotic persona. Forseti, however, is not only a deity of the sea, but also of justice and of mediation and judgment, peace. He is called upon to mediate peace between different tribes. His name in actual Norse means president, and he is a protector of seafarers, not someone who would necessarily unleash hell upon them. In many ways, he's a lot more like Varuna of the Hindu Vedic pantheon. Varuna is also a god of the sea and of justice and of righteousness. There are many aspects of Horsini's character that are in line with the sign of Pisces. The Pisces motif is not only often the sea god in many pantheons, but also in his particular character, Pisces is a mediator and is a water sign of peace and peacemaking, love and fairness. That makes him even more compatible with a, an astrological read of the pantheon than many other sea gods even. And it makes sense. He is, after all, the son of the two most prosperous deities in the Norse pantheon, Nana and Balder. And another little connection I want to make here is in my Hittite pantheon video, another chart that I've made. There's a deity that sounds like Varuna in the Hittite pantheon named Aruna, and he is the son of also the sun god, just like Balder, Tiwaz, and Shiwat. The Hittites certainly have more of a connection to the original Anatolian uh, Neolithic cultures and also Semitic cultures of the Middle East, but here we have it. As I have said, I am making a chart for every one of these videos. I figured that showing a chart would be the best visual representation of not only the research I'm doing, but also what I'm saying. Because often in a lot of these videos, I just say a lot. And I have said a lot this time too. It'll be quite, quite an endeavor to edit this video, frankly. In the comments, there were a few suggestions that I did Norse next. And at first I resisted because I figured there were enough people who studied Norse and there were enough videos about Norse out there. But I was tantalized by the prospect when I considered that not everybody shows Norse in a comparative mythology perspective, certainly not with an astrological coding system, of course. This chart is available really cheap for only $2.50, if, if even that, on, again, our Studio Pandemonia Etsy. If you'd like to download it, the link is in the description, and the download file comes with this version, which shows colors based on the different kind of dynastic groupings they have, Aesir, Vanir, etc. There's another version that has them colored here on their archetypes. So we have gold for fortune, fatal gods, green for earth deities, yellow for sun gods. And then we have a grayscale version that is optimized for printing out a regular sheet of paper in black and white. I have a few of them printed off right here. Our printer is a little messy, um, but it's still legible and can be something you can hold in your hand or put on a wall. It does not have all the zodiac signs like this on it. If you wanted some type of feature like that, you would have to ask for it in the comments maybe. If you want to see more of these, or you have another suggestion of a pantheon I should do next, please suggest it in the comments. Comments really help. They start boosting up us in the algorithm. Obviously, if you like the video, it will really help. Subscribe if you want to see some more. And I haven't asked before to share. I think, unfortunately, whenever I post my own videos in Reddit or other sort of services, people tend to take it down. But when you, as somebody who likes these videos, post them wherever you want to post them, people receive it much better. People, they seem to punish self-promotion, but promotion is totally fine. So please help promote my video. I am helpless without you. That being said, the next video I'm going to be doing in this style is going to be on the Etruscans. Leave your suggestion down below. 
and I'll try to read and respond to it. Thanks for watching, and happy mythology hunting for everyone.